So unless you've been living under a rock for the last 10 years, if you have, can I please join you? You've probably heard of Shovel Knight, arguably one of the most important games ever made. The game that made retro 2D platformers popular again. The game that popularized indie gaming. The game I thought was really cool. We won't be going over development history because I don't feel like doing that and I don't know how to start videos. So we're jumping right in. This video was originally supposed to be just talking about Shovel Knight, uh, but then I got a little carried away and whoops, this script is over 40,000 words. So allow me to take you down a walk through history of every Shovel Knight game. This is a retrospective of the entire Shovel Knight franchise. I'm going to be talking about the most recent version of Shovel Knight Treasure Trove containing all three slash four slash five games. Shovel of Hope, Plague of Shadows, Spectre of Torment, King of Cards, and some party game mode nobody cares about. We're going to be talking about them all individually with chapters denoting when we're talking about each. Since he's the guy on the box and the name of the game, we're going to start this by talking about Shovel Knight, Shovel of Hope. Yeah, we aren't getting people to dub this one, f*** that. I'm sorry, the Gunya video was fun, this game has way too much dialogue for that. Anyway, booting up Shovel Hope starts with a cutscene exploring the events, what happened leading up to it. Shovel Knight and his lover, slash best friend, slash some other third thing, Shield Knight, wandering the plains of wherever this game takes place in. Until one day, Shovel Knight and Shield Knight go to the Tower of Fate and try to get some kind of magic amulet there at its keep. But unfortunately, they are unsuccessful and Shield Knight is lost to the Tower, as Shovel Knight makes his escape. Since then, he's become a farmer, losing health open the whole adventuring thing after losing his best friend slash shield knight, dropping his moniker of a hero. But soon, someone known as the Enchantress arrived and started assembling a gang of gangling goons to go over the Grand Glaciers and there's no word that starts with G that means conquer. Seeing a threat on the horizon, Shovel Knight springs into action and decides to stop their nasty plot. And now it's time to actually play as Shovel Knight in level 1, The Plains. <laughs> This serves as a tutorial for the game, and you're going to be hearing me say that a lot. But give me like 30 minutes, I'll say it again. This serves to show us everything that Shovel Knight can do with his base abilities. He can obviously walk around, no duh, plus jumping. But much like Mega Man, this game's primary inspiration, jumping on enemies don't kill them. For that, you'll have to pull out his trusty and signature Desert E Shovel. You can do a few basic things with the shovel. Attack enemies straight in front of you with this quick jab, this swing also having the added benefit of reflecting projectiles, and then his signature shovel. Pogo. Being able to bounce off enemies, objects around him, bubbles, checkpoints, if it could be damaged, it could probably be bounced off of. And aside from a crouch that's literally useless, that's pretty much it. I mean, obviously there's his health, but I don't think I'll have to explain that. You get hit enough times, you go bye-bye. But that's pretty much it for now, which is fine because this is just the first level. And since it is, it's pretty boring. I'm still debating with myself if I should spend little time on each stage or go into them in depth because we have like four whole campaigns and two gather games on top of that and a party game side mode and a board game. So let's go to the boss. Black Knight basically serves as Shovel Knight's Shadow the Hedgehog. Nega Shovel Knight. I'm never saying that again. Black Knight serves as our rival for the time being and is attacked reflect that. Shovel swipes, the pogo, everything. Anything Shovel Knight can do, but with the added addition of shooting projectiles at you as well. But as it's intended to be, a pretty simple and easy fight. After he's defeated, he runs away like a little sissy baby, we can finally get to our world map where there's one more thing we have to do before the game opens up for us. We just have to run through this town here, I'll get to it more later because it makes sense that way. But now that we're through with that, we have a choice to make. The way forward is blocked off until we unlock two of these locks. To do that, we'll have to beat these levels. Prime or Keep, the Lair of King Knight, or the Lich Yard, the Lair of Spectre Knight. No matter what you choose, you must do both in order to progress, so let's start with Pride or Keep because that feels right. Pride or Keep is our first second level of the game, and if you just started out, it's going to be your actual first challenge. The enemies in the first level were nothing too special, the most dangerous they got were skeletons with little swords, but now we have mages that throw fireballs, and knights that will block your attacks, and King Knight's signature rats. Since we talked about Shovel Knight in the last stage, let's talk about this stage and this Shovel Knight. Since this game is heavily inspired by Mega Man, each stage is very long, but with checkpoints throughout. Something Shovel Knight does with checkpoints that I've never seen anywhere else in any other game, though, is that you can break them. If you do, you won't be able to go back to that checkpoint, but it'll give you gold in exchange. Usually around like 250-ish. Gold, if you couldn't guess, is used at shops in the towns and such, but it's not town time, it is pride more time. It becomes its really cool risk reward if you should break a checkpoint and get the cash, or play it safe and have somewhere to respawn. This becomes amplified when you're taken into consideration that upon death, you drop a bunch of gold. So is breaking a checkpoint for all those riches really worth it? Most times, no, but if you're a season of the game, go for it. Every level has five checkpoints and a ton of goodies to find inside, like a Kinder Egg. You guys think I just give up on writing? Like, have I said anything funny up to or after this point? Like, genuinely? 
You can often find hidden rooms scattered throughout levels that typically just contain a chest which gives you some gold, but sometimes can give you a sheet of music, more on that later. But the final thing that's consistent with every level is Chester. Chester is a guy who hides in a chest and totally, definitely, really actually found a relic in there, he's not lying. And what it is varies on which stage you're at. Usually it's a different gimmick that's used within that same level. For example, you get the flare wand in this stage, like how the mages throw fireballs. The flare wand takes four magic and goes in a straight line, it does the exact same amount of damage as your shovel swipe, so it's really just a pretty basic projectile. We'll talk about each relic as we go through the different stages, but right now let's talk about Pride more exclusive things, like the stage gimmicks and mini boss. In the first half, you'll have these buckets of lava that dump onto the player that are just basic obstacles on a timer, and in the latter half, these books that need to be activated by attacking them, and once turned on, will create some platforms that start a timer before they go away again. They're both incredibly basic, but what are you really expecting from what is actually the first level of the game? It's so basic we might as well just cut to the ball to the level, King Knight. Okay, so I actually considered dubbing this video with all of the cutscenes, but not only is there a stupid amount of dialogue considering the other campaigns, but also, somebody already did that. The video is by Jufus, I would really recommend you check it out. It's actually really well made. I especially like Tinker Knight's voice, he made him sound like the little goblin that he is. Anyway, King Knight, for a first time player, can really give you a run for your money. He jumps all over the place, he can stun you with a high jump, dash forward incredibly quickly, and even rain down confetti that can damage you. But really, everything he's doing is not too dissimilar to what Black Knight can do. Projectiles, jumping, a special jump that goes straight down, this level really is just a tutorial number two. Not to say that it isn't fun, but just to say that it's easy. Now that the Descendant Dandy has been bested, we can head over to the alternative option for first level, being the Lich Yard. And now the Lich Yard is a lot more. In depth, man, Pride more. Now the Lich Yard is a lot more in depth than its Pride more predecessor. There are these shrubs you can bounce off of, or alternatively, whack with your shovel to make them go higher in the air, then bounce off of for extra height. There are ghosts that you cannot kill, but only stun. There's a big old skeleton boy as a mini boss. Weighted platforms that need two entities to be on them at one time in order to go down. This stage will go dark at certain segments with lightning to back it up. Also. I the only one getting reminded of Lynn Land Luigi's Mansion right now. The darkness is kind of annoys you though. Like, could you imagine watching a YouTube video like this? I don't know why Luigi's Mansion came to mind. I was just kind of hoping you'd forget during the cutaway. The Lich Yard is definitely where it starts picking up in difficulty, especially with some of the platforming challenges that require the shovel pogo to reach higher areas. Luckily, the relic from the stage serves to alleviate that. The phase locket is an item that'll turn you invincible for two to three seconds. Shovel Light fans will convince you this item sucks ass, but allow me to defend it for a second. It's not only invincibility, but it's also an air stall, which can be more handy than you would think. It's not fantastic, especially considering the amount of magic it uses, but it's an okay enough relic. It's an okay enough relic, best of that air stall is especially good for when the stage blacks out, so you can have some extra time to adjust where you're jumping, because without it, these segments would be crazy annoying. Like lice. Anyways, I'm trying to be somewhat quick on specific levels, but also spend long enough to make it seem like I'm going in really in depth. So I say we head to Spectre Night now. So, Specky is a very tricky boss to pin down, often throwing his scythe around and teleporting to catch it, with, of course, mixing up how he'll do it. Straight down, across the whole thing, boomeranging back to him. He also has this big slash that can home in on you, along with his big move of raising the dead and making things go dark. But he's a pretty deceptively simple boss. He's definitely going to be the hardest one for you early on, though. Not crazy or anything, but cool. But that's the first two levels taken care of, so let's now head to the town. Oh boy, fellas! We're going to the town! This will be super interesting and definitely won't last a minute of discussion. This is basically your NPC hub for the game. Those sheets of music you find throughout the levels can be given to this bard here. For an exchange, he'll give you gems and the ability to listen to any song you want to, so Spotify. There are two shopkeepers here that'll increase your health and magic. One with meal tickets and the other you just have to buy. And you can find meal tickets either from this goat or another thing I'll talk about later. And finally, the basement where Chester is selling some goodies, like this orb that bounces all over the place and a fishing rod that lets you cash fish. fish. And this lady who will let you do this cool bottle mini game? She couldn't possibly be evil. Let's talk about the stuff Chester sells, though. The Chaos Orb will bounce all around and deal damage to enemies. Most scenarios, the Flare Wand is better, but I found the Chaos Orb to be really good against bosses because it can bounce off of walls. The Flare Wand, if you want to do two damage, you'll have to use eight magic since it's four magic per shot. But the Chaos Orb at six magic, if you bounce off of a wall, can deal damage twice. So in closed arenas where you fight.
fight bosses, I found the Chaos Orb to be pretty good for those. And the Fishing Rod, which is to fish fish. When there are sparkles in the water, you can fish up usually gold, but if you're lucky, you can fish up a Trouble Fish from the Trouble Pond. If you buy some chalices from this Chuple Acolyte here, then head down to the Trouble Pond, you can speak to the Trouble King, who will do an awesome dance while you fail some chalices. One that will restore your HP, one that will grant you invulnerability for 10 seconds, and a third shitty one. You can only carry two flasks on you at one time, so make sure you choose the right choice of not choosing the third one. Also, if you want to fill up any of these, you have to watch a one minute unskippable cutscene, like... LOL. Now that we're done with everything on the first screen here, and that lock is broken, we can head over to the second area where we have a choice between three different knights this time. The Explodatorium, the Lair of Plague Knight, the Iron Whale, the Lair of Treasure Knight, and the Lost City, the Lair of Mole Knight. Let's start with Plague Knight because I want to. So if you haven't already latched onto it, the basic flow of every Shovel Knight level is start off the level, get introduced a new gimmick, then proceed to use that gimmick throughout some part of the level, then alongside that introduce a different wackier gimmick. It reminds me a lot of Pizza Tower in that regard. One overarching gimmick with a different one to back it up. Like the Lich Yard had those plants you could jump off of along with the darkness of the screen. And for Plague Knights, it's these fire geysers you can run across throughout the entire level with exploding platforms during certain parts. Big fan of the enemies in this level too. This really cool mini boss that uses the potions pulled from the minigame earlier. These rats that would jump at you and explode. And these slime shovel knights. Plague Knight, why do you have these? Kinky bastard. While we're here, I would like to note that the Explodatorium theme is one of my favorite tracks in the entire game. I'll only say this once and bring it up when it's exceptionally good, but almost every song in the soundtrack is sublime. Buy it on Steam or listen to it however you may. Also, I completely forgot until just like, uh, now when I was going back and editing this script, but, uh, there's a relic here. The alchemy coin, uh, it's a coin that may or may not, when it kills an enemy, give you a bunch of cash. The chances are very low. This is not Plague Knight themed garbage. Not a ton else to talk about, so on to the boss, who's predictably Plague Knight. What? His boss fight might be one of my favorite and most unique fights in the entire game thus far. He has this arena with blocks filling in the bottom of it, and as the fight goes on, he'll break more of them with his potions he throws at you. Summoning big vats that can chain react and explode, trails of fire that go across the ground, genuinely a pretty difficult boss, especially with how mobile he is. This is where the game really starts spicing up with the difficulty, but it's still like the third boss of the game, so yeah, good night. Speaking of good night, every night Shovel Knight has a freight recurring dream of Shield Knight falling from the sky and him having to catch her. Various enemies will try to stop you, but his love for her will always break through in the end. Drama Queen! Anyway, now that we have cleared out the Explodatorium, we can head to the second town which was previously locked to us. The second town, known as the Armor Outpost, is like the first town but way cooler, mainly because of the airship area where you can upgrade your armor and your shovel. I'll go over the shovel upgrades first, since they're simpler. Three upgrades, all permanent. One will give you a spark across the ground that you can shoot at max health, like Link's sword beam. One will let you charge your shovel to deal more damage, and the final one will let you dig up mounds of dirt in one swipe, who cares? But the armor upgrades are actually way cooler. A bunch of different ones to choose from that I don't remember the names of any of them, so I'm just going off color. The red armor, which lets you drop less doubloons when you die. This one's just whatever. The purple armor will grant you more magic, but you take more damage. Not the greatest, but definitely still useful. The silver armor will, if you pogo off of somebody's head twice in a row, it'll give you a free charge slash to use at a moment's notice. Honestly, probably the best one. The black armor, which will cause you not to take any knockback from enemies, but you slide way more. So if you ever want that classic Mega Man experience, Experience, here you go. And the gold armor, which is literally useless but funny. Unlike the shovel upgrades, these cannot stack, so pick wisely. The silver armor every time is the best one. Also, there's like a boss fight here or something, it's barely noteworthy at all. I'll talk about it like way later. Might as well move on to the next level already, no reason for my thought process here, so off to Treasure Knight. So Treasure Knight stage is our only water level of the game, and since it's a water level in a game that isn't Mario or Sonic, it's actually really fun. It doesn't slow you down at all, instead only making you jump higher and fall slower, like how Mega Man X did it in Launch Octopus. This is probably one of, if not my favorite level in the whole game. Not only is the water just a fun way to mix things up, but I love almost everything about this stage. It intertwines with its gimmicks beautifully. There are these snails that can only be attacked by swiping forward, since their heads are sticking out from that direction. And when you get them into their shells, you can ricochet them off walls, which works perfectly with every other enemy being able to get simultaneously subsided if shot with one of these scattershot shells. These tentacle enemies that are not only roadblocks, but platforms. Everything connects with each other masterfully in this level. I love it. It has a fun mini boss against this big fish carrying around Chester. These anchors that fall down and can be used as platforms. This fucking music.
Genuinely top five songs in the soundtrack, you really incorporated the Pokemon bump into wall sound effect and made it sound good. Speaking of Chester, his item for this stage is the throwing anchor. Perfect for those pesky pests that patrolled precariously above you. Aside from that, it's the only relic that can go through walls, so if there's an enemy below you, it's good for that too. Still better than the alchemy coin. Also, I love the build up to the boss where you have to ride one of those rocket platforms across his entire vault. It, it just looks so good. On to the boss, who was one of my favorites, Treasure Knight. Just looking at him, you would assume he wouldn't be the most mobile of the bosses, but look at him just flying all over the place. And I'm coming back and editing my script right now because I learned the completionist made a one hour long Shovel Knight video a few months ago at the time of posting this. I felt like bringing that up while we're fighting the knight that hoards money and distributes none of it. He mostly uses his grappling anchor to move around. He can perform quick dashes, slamming onto the ground, creating huge waves of gold, and even throwing a chest that tries to suck you in that doesn't damage you but takes 500 gold. This didn't happen to me because just hold left, but still. He's still pretty easy, all things considered, especially if you brought the silver armor because of his size, he's incredibly easy to pogo off of. I also love his death pose, how he has. I'm sorry to inform you, but there was a joke here where I screamed Gyat at this, but, uh... Not only upon, for, I, I didn't record, I, for, I forgot to record that for one, but also looking at it more, that is clearly a damn backpack. Unfortunately, it is not his ginormous ass sticking up. Mole Knight! So Mole Knight stage plays the part of the lava level of the game, and I really like how it makes use of this overused gimmick. I mean, almost every platformer has a lava world, so the only way to make it not suck is to make it different, and luckily, Shovel Knight delivers. First off, the enemies, who are probably the most whatever part of the level. There are some shield guys that run around, these fire variants of those slimes from around, if there was a third unique enemy for this level, I forgot about it. But the new things it brings to the table are really fun. It's mostly just lava everywhere mixed with lava rise on top of this bug, but halfway through you get introduced to slime. You can knock into the lava, making it bounce and not kill you. And pretty much the rest of the level is them trying to see how far they can push it, with different ways of getting the slime to the lava. Hitting it in the air, hitting it onto a platform, they do a lot with it and it's a lot of fun. It feels like those Mario Maker levels that have overarching gimmicks to them, how they just try to mix up how one task is performed. It's pretty much exactly like that. And since this place is technically a mine shaft run by the titular Mole Knight, the relic for this level is the Dust Knuckles, letting you punch through lines of dirt without falling. These things are by far the most situational relic, but that doesn't mean I don't like them. One of their biggest strengths is being able to punch through shields or enemies blocking, so like the ones the gold armors have. Funnily enough, the guys who have shields and run at you pretty much stop appearing after you get these, which is really funny. Hugely situational, but pretty fun. Anyway, no way to transition to this, but off to the boss, who is Mole Knight. Probably our hardest boss yet. He can fly through the walls at wicked speeds, throw blocks of dirt at you, throw blocks on top of you, bury himself and shoot fire everywhere, just do whatever the hell this is. Probably the hardest, probably one of my favorites. Well, the mole's been blinded, and the lock's keeping us away from the next screen of broken, so we can finally go take down the last bosses of the game. The Clockwork Tower, the Layer of Tinker Knight, the Stranded Ship, the Layer of Polar Knight, and the Flying Machine, the Layer of Propeller Knight. But before we talk about those levels, I would like to talk about something completely unrelated. So as you go through the game, you can find these wandering MP PCs that are all around the place, and they can do one of a few things. These wandering enemies that will make you go through a stage that's a minute or two long, a level that just loads you up with gems, or a boss fight with a unique person. Let's quickly run through them all, cause why not? Reese, who couldn't possibly be important later. He's a ninja who's wandering around the plains looking for evil bad guys to fight. Oh, no. He's nothing too special. He throws boomerangs, he pulls out a car that lets him summon a shield of fire around him. He's not incredibly important. For now. Baz, who is a dejected member of the Order of No Quarter. My name is Gaz, the person who made the thumbnails named Maz, and I'm fighting somebody named the Baz. If you brought the silver armor to this fight, he's a joke because you can just keep pogoing off his whip continuously. But aside from that, he's a lot of fun. I like his lightning gimmick. Easy as hell, but fun. You also get to fight Black Knight again, who is just here, I guess. His fight's harder this time. He'll even reflect back projectiles until you get into a dead man's volley with him, which is pretty cool. But it's literally just Black Knight for a second time. And Phantom Striker, a knight with thunder abilities who constantly keeps his guard up. So he's actually rather hard- wait, do you think I could just- yeah, yeah, never mind, I totally can. But that's all of the unrelated stuff I'll be going over for now. Back to the actual regular stages, of which we have Tinker Knights next, because I said so. So the Clockwork Tower is by far the level with the most moving parts out of any of them. I mean, right out of the gate, you're already showing off three moving platforms, which is just an amazing sign for what's to come. Flying swords that try to get you, the game's only auto-scrolling segment, platforms that extend, gears you can bounce off of, lots and lots of junk. I don't actually have a ton to say about this stage, so I might as well talk about the relic. The Mobile Gear is a platform you can summon that'll ride across any ground, be it instant kill or not. So spikes are fair game. And when you're riding it, it can jump over gaps in the time comes 
comes for it. It's fine, I guess. One of the more situational and useless ones, but it's okay. Definitely not worth eight magic, though. Something, something I'm good at reviewing video games, Tinker Knight. Now, up to this point, you've been taught not to judge a knight by his size, because Treasure Knight and Mole Knight are both two of the biggest and most mobile out of them, so you'd expect Tinker Knight to follow in the same vein of being imposing, even though he's tiny. Wrong. Listen to his boss music, look how he's fighting, it's hilarious. They even timed the intro to his song as he flops face first on the ground, this is incredible. His first phase of theme is actually really good though. But as I just said, and you probably guessed, he has a second phase, where he ditches the head-on approach and jumps into a giant-ass mech. It's equally as pathetic. So you need to climb up the mech and then bounce on his head while he's up there? But since they have- Now you can't just keep bouncing on his head infinitely, he's got missiles up there shooting right above his head to counteract this. Luckily, I have my stupid invincibility amulet to counteract the counteracting. Yeah, his boss is kind of a joke. In the first half it's funny, in the second half it's depressing. I have no segue into this next one, I'm just kind of doing them sporadically, so propeller night. I hope you like falling in holes. Aesthetics-wise, this is probably my favorite level in the whole game. A trope I just die for in games is the flying airship locale. Something about a boat with giant-ass propellers on it is something that's so appealing to me. It's probably because I grew up with New Super Mario Bros. Wii, but still. The entire stage is basically just starting from where it's docked on the ground and climbing your way up to the top. It looks incredible visually as well. I haven't really brought it up because it doesn't really need explanation, but it copies the NES art style exceptionally well. A lot like the Mega Man games on that console, sometimes backgrounds will just be a solid color, and sometimes they'll be intricate with big dynamic whatever you call them. And Shovel Knight copies that pretty much to a T. Like, look at the background of when you're fighting the fish mini boss and the Iron Whale. Literally nothing back there. But then look at the background for the Clockwork Tower during this segment with the big spike pit. It's all really good eye candy. Anyway, Propeller Knight's gimmicks are pretty much just, hey, we have a bunch of pits everywhere, die now, mixed with changing winds in different directions. That's pretty much it, but the platforming and everything else at the level really carries it. The only enemies to really speak of are these electric jellyfish that sporadically turn on and some annoying ass fan guys. Also, those knights from before have jetpacks now, awesome. But the best part of the stage is the relic you get from here. The propeller dagger is the best relic in the game. For the price of four magic, you can perform an air dash. There's really nothing too special about it, it's just extra mobility. So of course it's amazing. It can also be used to cheese the hell out of a majority of the platforming segments in this game. If they gave this to you earlier on, I would be unstoppable. No point of lingering on this stage any longer, on to propeller knight. God, I wanna suck his cock. <laughs> I haven't talked about it up to this point, but I love Shovel Knight's dialogue. It's nothing super spectacular, but these roasts against some of the knights are really great. He calls Propeller Knight a gyroscopic jester, I love him. So Propeller Knight is a knight specifically trained with the lance, so he keeps his guard up dust knuckles. Aside from how easily you can abuse him with relics, specifically the dust knuckles and throwing anchor, he's actually a pretty fun boss. He'll do dashes all around the place. If you pogo on him for too long, he'll blast you into the air and try to catch you. And halfway through the flight, he'll fly into the air and summon a ship to blast cannonballs at the stage. Also, because of the holes on the stage and the Dust Knuckles moving you forward, the last hit I delivered sent me into a pit right as he was defeated, so Shovel Knight was off-screen for the victory. It was very comical. Finally, onto our last knight of the game, Polar Knight. So as you could probably predict by his name, being Polar Knight, his stage is an ice level. Okay, don't get me wrong, ice levels annoy me, but this one's not actually that bad. The sliding isn't too obnoxious, and plus, most of the level doesn't even take place on ice anyhow, so who cares? Most of it just takes place inside of the aforementioned stranded ship. Definitely my second favorite stage aesthetically. The background is really nice and beautiful with the Aurora Borealis. The interior of the ship makes me feel like I'm in an early game Terraria house. I like it. The enemies here are kind of disappointing me though. Like, one of its only unique enemies is just a reskin of the shield guys from Mole Knight's stage. There are wolves and people who throw spears, I guess. Yes, they got nothing. Speaking of nothing, is this stage's relic, the Warhorn. The Warhorn is an area of effect relic that does a giant instant kill circle around you that costs 20 magic. Yeah, this thing sucks. Genuinely, I didn't even use this once in the stage I got it in. And also, by the way, just in case you thought this thing would be good against bosses, it only does a single point of damage to foes that are not regular enemies. So many members of the Order of No Quarter barely take any damage against this thing. It blows, literally and figuratively. Sorry I don't have too much to say about this one, but it's a nice level. What do you want? I like these bird statues you hit with your shovel and they like go across the ground, I guess, but 
that's kind of this level's only gimmick. I mean, there's this powdered snow you have to walk into before going across these spikes, but like, can't you just use like the gear cart or the invincibility item they gave you in the second level? Like, sure, that'll take a hell of a lot more magic, but it's faster. Something, something, it's boss time. Polar Knight is the most whatever boss in the game for me. He'll shovel snowballs at you, charge at you, and that's literally it for the first phase. Then he'll start putting spikes everywhere, which is, yes, an instant kill. So he's often just more annoying than difficult. It's either you obliterate him without a shred of difficulty or you die 50 times. It can go either way. Probably my least favorite stage and boss in the whole game, if I'm being real. But still not bad, just in comparison to every other level. Get ready for me to talk about the same eight stages another three times. But now that all of the Order of No Quarter has been defeated, we can finally move on to the last stages of the game. Basically, this game's Sigma slash Wily stages. So in Mega Man X, how it did the classic final levels at the end of the game was by having you fight every boss in the main game in each level you went through instead of just having a big boss rush at the end like how classic Mega Man does it. Instead of that, it uses every gimmick we've used up to this point from the different stages, like the buckets of lava and chandelier platforms from King Knight's stage in the first half and the darkness sections from the Lich Yard in the second half. Mix that with this level just genuinely being difficult and you have yourself a great start to the finale. Literally, I walked into this stage with 20k gold and I walked out with 9,000. I got steamrolled. Spike pits, regular pits, new shinobi enemies that are genuinely difficult and also are the only reason you should ever use the Warhorn ever. And since we've already talked about most of these gimmicks, we might as well just skip to the end of the stage. Black Knight comes back and as per usual is being a total knob, so we have to put him in his place again. But this time he's doped up on Enchantress Goop. Can I just say him with wings is one of the most badass designs in gaming? He's gone from Shadow to Setheroth. This fight is perfect. Okay, it's perfect. Let me break it down because this fight is perfect. I love it so much. Oh my god. The music, the visual fidelity, the food, oh, the atmosphere. So perfect. Okay, so first off, the music, which, oh my god. It peaks like 20 seconds into the song, but it kind of needed to because it does right when he grows wings and starts going into his flying phase. When he's on the ground at the start of the fight, he'll shoot those projectiles from earlier, but mixing in teleportation. A little bit into it, he'll start flying, summoning down meteors, which just looks stunning by the way. And then his shovel pogos from before can break those, sending waves at the player. This fight is legitimately a top 10 video game boss fight for me. It's absolutely fantastic. Anywho, we lay a beat down on him for the third time, and he explains his motivation. He was never a part of the Order of No Quarter, but instead wanted to protect the Enchantress because he knew who she was. The Enchantress just so happened to come about right after Shield Knight's disappearance because Shield Knight is the Enchantress. He didn't want anybody to harm her, so instead tried becoming allies and to snap her out of it with words. Which, of course, was unsuccessful, so it's up to Shovel Knight to save the day, predictably. And on to Enchantress Stage 2 we go. The second level follows roughly the same as the first one. Start off with the Treasure Knight segment underwater with some of his enemies, then a Mole Knight segment with just fire, not a lot else. No Plague Knight segment though, wonder if there's a lore reason for that. Then a Polar Knight segment with those bird statues. And finally a Tinker Knight segment where it scrolls upwards. No Propeller Knight segment though, but that's probably because he's a bitch. We already talked about all of these ideas and gimmicks already, so there's no real reason to go over them again. So let's just skip to the boss, which is just more shit we already did. Classic Mega Man boss rush, been there, done that, moving on. Okay, one thing I do like though is how the game gives you an opportunity to save them or not after they've been defeated. Nothing happens if you do or don't, but it's a nice option. On to the third third level of whatever it's called. Good golly, I'm so good at writing. Time to tackle the final Enchantress level and end this. Oh no, blocks that come straight at the player, what will I do? Yeah, okay, we're just gonna move on. Ah, look at these blocks coming from the floor. Aren't you game designers cool? Okay, sorry, I'm being negative. It's final boss time. Who is predictably the Enchantress, aka Shield Knight. Her first phase takes cues from Plague Knights in the way that the floor is destructible. The difference being that there's a pit down there instead of just more floor. And her purple fire attacks can break said floor. And aside from replacing the floor when she breaks it, that's really all she does. And also a dash, I guess, but all of her attacks are just mixing up how she can shoot fire at you. And honestly, it's not as bad as it sounds. Not a ton I can say about it, though, because... It's just fire. But after dealing the final blow, the amulet shatters, freeing Shield Knight from her mental prison. And just as that dream that occurs every night you clear a screen, she falls and Shovel Knight catches her. Okay, breaking the mood for a second, I've always jumped and caught her. I have genuinely no idea what would happen if I didn't. <laughs> But they can't go home and celebrate yet. They have one final thing to deal with. Right after the amulet shattered, the soul of the Enchantress was let free. And now it's time for the final boss. You can't reach her by yourself, and all of your relics will just bounce right off of her. The only way to reach her is to bounce off of Shield Knight's... 
the hell is that thing called again? After three pogos on her head, she'll move out of the way and you'll have to restart the process of dodging projectiles and waiting for Shield Knight to jump up and give you the go-ahead. Or use the propeller dagger, that works too. Yeah, she just kind of crumbles when you use the propeller dagger on her, but still cool. She just kind of shoots balls of energy at you and removes the floor. It's not a hard fight, but it's not really supposed to. It's just kind of for spectacle, and honestly, that's okay. But with one final swipe of the shovel, the Enchantress's soul finally goes down. But they're not out of the woods yet. Right as they're celebrating, she takes one final blast at Shovel Knight, immobilizing him. Shield Knight, with no other options, during a lull in the blast, jumps in starting to protect him from it. Black Knight runs into the room and tries to help as much as he can, but Shield Knight knows there's no option where all of them escape the Tower of Fate. She tells him to grab Shovel Knight and get out of there. And at the very least, she got to see both of them together one last time. And that's it, the Tower of Fate crumbles somehow, genuinely no clue how that happened. Think of the property value! And the day has been saved. Every member of the Order of No Quarter pays their dues, at least the ones that directly affected people. So Spectre Knight, Propeller Knight, Polar Knight, and Plague Knight kind of just went home and did whatever. Black Knight drags Shovel Knight back to his camp, and we roll credits. Overall, Shovel of Hope is a phenomenal platformer. I would say on the shorter side, but I don't really have any frame of reference for that because they interspersed playing this game with playing Fortnite. I had a damn stroke when Propeller Knight called the ball or Chappelle Royale, I'll tell you that. I genuinely don't have any complaints I can really pin against it. I mean, I guess some stages are more on the boring side, Pride More Keep, The Lost City, and The Stranded Ship, but that's really all I can think of. They aren't even bad stages, just ones with not huge gimmicks. All of his armors were useful, nearly all of the relics were useful, nearly. It looks really nice, the controls feel great, the music is superb, there's barely anything I can even tag against this. Just classic platforming perfection. Okay, that's adorable. What great friends! So now that we're done with Shovel of Hope, prepare for me to talk about Shovel of Hope again in about a minute or two, and then five minutes from now. Before we hop into our next campaign of Treasure Trove, let's look at some of Shovel Knight's crossover, because I'm bored. So there's obviously all of the other games he's been in, Ukulele, Rivals of Aether, and Smash Brothers. But what about the crossovers in his own game? Well, for that, we're gonna have to take a look at the console-exclusive variants of this game. Yeah, not a lot of people know this, but depending on if you own the Nintendo, Xbox, or PlayStation version of this game, you get an extra fun thing inside of it. Also, if you own this game on PC, you get nothing because you suck and you smell bad. Let's start lame and get cooler as we go on. So specifically on the Nintendo versions of the game, they have amiibo support. Shovel Knight, Plague Knight, Spectre Knight, and King Knight all got amiibos, which is pretty cool. It's nice owning figures of these little guys, but what is way lamer is what they actually do. So if you're playing the campaign of the respective knight you're using, the amiibo of, like the Plague Knight amiibo and Plague of Shadows, you can either summon a fairy of any knight you want from Madame Meeber, or for everybody except except Shovel Knight, you can put on a cool new costume. It looks pretty cool for everybody except for King Knight. He looks gross and bald with it on. Put that damn thing back on flat top, but Shovel Knight gets something else. Also, there's a variant of the Shovel Knight amiibo that makes him all gold, but it literally does the exact same thing as the regular amiibo. This is why the country's going to shit. So, Shovel Knight has to earn that cool costume because his campaign's amiibo, instead of just doing one thing, and that's it, it gives you a custom knight you can make. And also, the two-player mode is locked behind this because, of course it is. I did not test it. I could imagine Imagine Shovel Knight multiplayer not being very fun, but why did you have to lock it behind the Nintendo version? And even then, behind a figure you have to buy? Anyway, the cool thing is the Custom Knight. He plays identically to Shovel Knight, that is because he is Shovel Knight, but the difference is instead of having to buy meal tickets or magic and buy relics, you can just level up through collecting cash instead, giving you random relics each level up. It's whatever, I guess, not nearly as cool as the other console-specific versions. What's mainly fueling that is, one, you have to pay for these figures if you want to use them, and two, the things they give you aren't very cool. So, who cares? Hi, you caught me editing my own video that I poorly researched to add an extra five minutes to it. So when I initially got that footage of me playing as the Custom Knight, I only did it for like five minutes because I assumed you'd just get relics and health upgrades in a staggered order. And frankly, I didn't really care to play anymore. Until much later in the video, when I was editing a different segment where Shovel Knight Rivals of Aether has an item known as the Ghost Gauntlets, I assumed this was an original creation for the game. Until I decided to actually fact check my dumb rushed self, it was only then that I learned the custom
custom knight has its own unique relics, upgrades, a bunch of other nonsense. So yeah, we're talking about it for longer than I expected. Whoopsie. Also, before I spiral off into that, the amiibo knight doesn't lock a two-player behind it. Yeah, I was just wrong with that one. I thought it did because it used to back in the day, which is where I guess I got that misconception from. But no, apparently through an update, they made it to where every version of the game has co-op. I also didn't fact check the multiplayer thing because I f***ing suck at making video essays. Starting off small and getting cooler as we go, each amiibo unlocks new challenge stages. Yeah, cool, who cares? Moving on. Depending on how many levels you have, you can change the palette and skin of Shovel Knight. So body swap at the base, upgrade, and then later on you could be a fish, I guess. There are also trails, emotes, a bunch of junk like that, just aesthetics. But what isn't aesthetics are your charge moves and special moves. You get a bunch of these in equip, but only two at a time. But they do a bunch of neat stuff, like the Burrow Bomber lets you charge forward, the Flare Razor lets you drop down and create pillars of fire, remember that for later. But the way cooler ones are the special moves. You can unlock a dash, a cloud you can use to glide on, a double jump, or just Plague Knight's bombs, because why not? Now, all of that is really neat, but the cherry on top of all of this is the exclusive relics. Seven whole new relics are created just for this. The Flare Rod will create an explosion directly in front of you, dealing three hits. Primarily good for bosses. The Toe Anchor is great if you want to reliably fall in pits. The formerly mentioned Ghost Gloves that are literally just the dust knuckles but with projectiles taped onto them. The Buzzsaw Boomerang, which is useless, don't use it. Shadow Knight will cast a little dude in front of you. The Rising Dagger will let you go upwards, which would be way better if I didn't already have a Plague Knight burst and double jump or whatever. And finally, the Infinite Dagger, a variant of the Propeller Dagger that travels at an infinite distance until stopped. Yeah, of course this is busted. With all of this, I take back what I previously said. This isn't horribly lame. This is just regularly lame. Yeah, I kind of had to do a whole two-hour playthrough just to get the experience of this guy. And the other exclusives I just think are better. Not only because they're more fun to do, but like... Y you'll just see, okay? Speaking of those exclusives, now an actually cool version is the Xbox Ones. So if you own this game on Xbox One or Series X, you can get an exclusive fight. So if you go to the Hall of Champions, which I'm unsure if I talked about or not, you go here, you fight a bunch of ghosts, you do the most annoying boss on the planet, moving on. But if you go into the secret room all the way to the right of the screen, then go into the far right of that area here and shovel Pogo, you can find a hidden room with a curious map on it. Taking this map will unlock a new place to go to in the overworld. And entering it, This game is a masterpiece. So, the Nintendo version got some crummy-ass amiibo figures, and the Xbox One got the pissing Battletoads as a boss. Pimple Bash or whatever the name of the third one was all show up here. I'm not going to pretend like I've ever played a Battletoads game, so all of this is new to me. Out of all the version exclusives, this one definitely had the most effort poured into it. We start off with this vertical shaft that I'm honestly not even going to try to hype up, it's very unfun. You only have one attack option, and there are these stupid-ass rats that instant kill you with their scissors. And the boss you fight here has literally two moves. One where he turns to a dumbbell and charges at you, and the other one where he bunches you with his large fist. But the second phase is actually really cool. You get to go through the classic Battletoads Turbo Tunnel. This is genuinely so cool that they went through the effort of changing up the game this drastically twice just for one boss. The Turbo Tunnel is pretty fun, even though I suck at it. The only thing I don't like are these dumbass birders that kill you in one shot. That's no fun. But this whole segment's pretty good. And finally, it ends off with a proper boss against the other green one. He mostly just jumps around, but he can summon the other two Battletoads to help him out, so there's some variety here. It reminds me of that one phase of Sally stage play from Cuphead. I don't know why that came to mind, I just thought of it here. But they go down predictably, and as a reward for defeating them, they give you the toad armor. Yeah, stick with the silver one. It lets you run, do fast shovel swipes, gives you more damaging pogo, and gives you a dash attack. The downside is that your regular shovel swipes do half as much damage, yeah, who cares. Honestly, a lot of fun, especially considering that this whole thing is both free and optional. But on to by far the coolest one out of all of them. So in all of the PlayStation versions of the game, either PS3, PS Vita, PS4, or PS5, if you go to the Hall of Champions again, located in the same spot, you'll get a different map, this one with the Omega symbol on it. Then, if you go back to the hub world, you'll see a strange robed figure wandering around. I mean, Microsoft allowed them to have the Battletoads, which are admittedly one of Xbox's dead franchises, so who would Sony allow Shovel Knight to fight? Maybe Sly Cooper, or Jack and Daxter, maybe even Spyro? It's Kratos. It is f***ing insane to me that the Shovel Knight developers pulled this off. This would be like if Shovel Knight got to face Link or Kirby in battle. This is so bizarre and so damn cool. His fight isn't just novelty though, he's genuinely one of the hardest bosses in the game, probably the hardest for the time you fight him. For one, your relics won't work on him, and two, it's the pissing god of war we're talking about. He doesn't pull his punches at all, he'll hit you with his... 
weights of chaos, use them to grapple to the walls, do this spin thing with them, and if you had any thought in your mind that pogoing on him would be fine, no! He'll do this swipe followed by this badass spike into the wall doing ludicrous amounts of damage to you. I died twice doing this and I have dozens of playthroughs to this game, and I struggled. It gets even worse when he powers up halfway through and starts dragging pillars down, being more frantic, and he doesn't even stop when he deplete his health bar neither because he just breaks the floor and now we're in a flying segment. This is one of the coolest crossover fights I've experienced in a video game. And fun fact, this is canon. Both the lead developer on God of War and Yacht Club games said this was canon. Factor that in with the Battletoads also being canon to this universe, and that means that Kratos from God of War and the f***ing Battletoads could have crossed paths at some point in a real video game. That also means that Shovel Knight has canonically defeated Kratos, which means when it comes to power scaling, which I know is cringe, he is more powerful than the guy who killed Zeus. Which also means that this stupid f***ing idiot death battle where they said Scrooge McDuck would beat Shovel Knight is stupid and dumb and lame and I hate it! How could they be so wrong? Now, just like the Battletoads did, Kratos gives you an award for beating him, being some buffed up Shovel, and the title of Ghost of Shovels. I like the idea that Shovel Knight and Kratos both left on good terms with each other. Poker Knight at the Collection 3, I want these two in it. Anyway, taking it to the Blacksmith, he immediately breaks it, but on the upside, you get some badass armor out of it. The Chaos Armor will give you Kratos's I already forgot the name, Blades, and when you defeat enemy, orbs come out of them, replacing magic, which will be in instantly collected. Collecting food will give you green orbs that replenish your health, and most enemies drop red orbs now, which will charge up some flame wall thing that flies forward. Also, his basic attack now becomes this stupendous air staller along with being just good to use. By far the best armor in the game. It also just has more swag than the Battletoads armor, let's be real here. But that's all of the crossover Shovel Knight got in his own game. All of them are free, except for the figures you have to buy separately for the Nintendo versions. They could have sold the fights separately as DLC, but honestly, that kind of removes the magic of discovering this naturally, and you might be thinking they would make up the profits by hardcore fans buying the separate releases on consoles. That would be correct. I'll talk more about crossovers later, but now let's head on to our second campaign, Shovel Knight Plague of Shadows. Long ago, the planes are untamed, yada yada yada, Shield Knight gets dunked on, skipping forward. The Order is created, okay, here we are. Plague Knight, unlike the other members of the Order, had a more nefarious plot going on behind the scenes, to craft a potion so powerful it'll grant him his wildest dreams. And unfortunately for every member of the Order, they are unknowingly guarding an ingredient he needs, and conveniently for the game developers, each of them have one. So he's off on his quest, starting in the same place Shovel Knight does, the Plains of Passage. The planes are largely the same as it was last time, just some minor changes here and there, mainly made to accommodate for Plague Knight. Since it's the same damn thing, let's talk about how Plague Knight plays. Sounds like a Let's Play channel. Don't you tell me how many calories I need, bitch! Him and Shovel Knight are almost complete polar opposites. When it comes to how they play, Shovel Knight mostly benefited from being on the ground at most times. This was so he could use his array of relics to blast foes. If anybody got above him, he could use his throwing anchor. If anybody's in front of him, he could use the flare wand or chaos orb. Really, the best option he had for mobility in the air was the shovel drop for getting down safely and the propeller blade, which lets you dash forward. Plague Knight, on the other hand, greatly benefits from being in the air. For starters, he not only has a double jump, but he has a chargeable burst he can use as a makeshift triple jump, giving you incredible velocity. His bombs, when used on the ground, just have a tiny little arc that honestly isn't great, but when used in the air, they can not only be used to slow your descent, get f***ed, phase lock it, but he also spikes them towards the ground instead. If you mix in the stall from the bombs he throws and using your burst properly, he can have a quadruple jump. Charge the burst on the ground, jump, burst immediately, and start charging your next burst. Double jump, burst again, it's that simple. And because of all of this, he just does leaps and bounds over shovel when it comes to how he can move. Very similar to his boss in that regard, how most of the challenge was just trying to pin him down in one spot. He's so ridiculous that Black Knight, who is a worthy foe for Shovel Knight at the start of the game, couldn't even lay a finger on Plague Knight because of how fast he moves. But on the ground, he slides all over the place and can't do much in the way of attacking. God, these guys would be cool in a platform fighter. A good platform fighter. Anyway, we clear through Black Knight, and using his Black Knight powers, he knows that we're trying to build a Mondo powerful potion and tries to intervene, but you already know how that goes. Okay, I'm going to rant about this game's four campaigns for at least one minute and 37 C cents. This was one of the only things drawing me back from creating this video, but how the f do I structure all of this? Okay, so Shovel Knight and Plague of Shadows both largely share the same campaign. They both happen at the same time, they both arrive at the town at the same point, but Spectre of Torment and King of Cards are both prequels to these campaigns. 
so I'll just talk about them in release order, which is the simple solution. But that won't work, because Shovel of Hope and Plague of Shadows are pretty much the same game with plot differences and different characters. They are largely the same experience, but Spectre of Torment has different music, different hub world, different level layouts, different plot, different boss designs, it is extremely different from the other two. Basically, its own game. So you would think King of Cards, also being a prequel, happened around the same time as Spectre of Torment, would be a lot like Plague of Shadows in the way that's pretty much the same campaign. Wrong! King of Cards follows a traditional platform layout of having 30 smaller levels instead of like 10 big ones. So it just had to be different from every other campaign in this goddamn game! So do I talk about all of these at the same time? That wouldn't work because King of Cards has its own unique bosses and stage designs and gimmicks and stupid f***ing nonsense. How about chronologically? Well that would mean I'm talking about Shovel of Hope at the end of the video. A video about Shovel Knight where I don't talk about Shovel Knight until the end. Or how about I make four different videos and then make a big video compiling all of them, something called like Gaspacho 1 talks about Shovel Knight Treasure Trove. Well that would be stupid because I would have to talk about each boss like and it's a new thing every single time. And that just wouldn't be fun at all. Or how about- Yeah I just went with the simplest option. Sorry that that was barely related to Plague of Shadows, but I am so frustrated with these damn campaigns. I just- I needed to get that off my chest. <laughs> anyway, to the town we go! As I said a few minutes ago, Plague Knight and Shovel Knight both arrive at the town at the same time. Okay, well technically almost the same time, he gets there like three seconds earlier and isn't allowed inside. He has to blow up this stupid mole's childhood house to get in, and then you're allowed into this game's version of the town. This is though that word is too hard to pronounce for me, and it is your one-stop shop for everything you'll need. Mona here was that lady from the bottle minigame before who is possibly evil. <coughs> She'll aid you by mixing up the things you can do with your bombs. All of these upgrades you can apply on the fly with lots of different things you can try. They're broken up into fuses, powders, and casings. Each will add a fun little gimmick to your bombs. Fuses are the simplest, so it'll just change how long it takes for one to detonate. Long fuse, short fuse, pretty fuse, self-explanatory. Powders will alter what happens when a bomb explodes, like producing fire that sticks to surfaces or waves of fire. The more powerful ones generally let you throw less bombs, however. And finally, casings will change how a bomb is thrown, going higher, bouncing, being absolutely useless, a lot of different stuff. And all of this is changeable on the go, so if you don't like an upgrade, you can just take it off in that second. Or maybe put it back on for specific situations. I won't go over all of them because there's far too many of these stupid little things, and much more of them when you take combining them into consideration. So now that we have some neat tools to our disposal, let's go through all of them at King Knight. Okay, I'm not gonna spend too long on all of these stages, but just let me talk about this one as an excuse to talk about the differences of Plague of Shadows. First of all, each stage now has a new section to it, Plague Knight exclusive. It's really nothing special, just a little challenge that gives a lore reason to how Chester found the relics in the first place. That bastard didn't find those in a chest at all! That lying son of a bitch! <laughs> You don't have to buy any of the Arcana, which is a regional, regional dialect of what Plague Knight calls relics. Instead, they're traded for the relic you found earlier in the stage, that's then given to Shovel Knight. Which was a very good decision because the bomb upgrades will be draining most of your cash throughout the game. The only other way they change things up is the Cypher Coins. The Cypher Coins are placed sporadically throughout levels, and then the way you unlock new bombs you can buy from Mona. These are scattered all over the place, so the player will learn different ways you can reach new areas. Like bursting and jumping into bursts and stuff. It's a really clever way of teaching the player how to do certain things things and rewarding them for it. Looking past that, that's really everything that's different for Plague Knight. Almost every stage is largely the same, so we're not gonna be doing the, now that both of those stages have been beaten, we can move on to the next screen, thing we did earlier. Instead, I'm just going to talk about the game as an overview from here on out. Also, King Knight is even more pathetic than last time because of Plague Knight's godlike movement, and we learn what Plague Knight is actually after, each knight's essence. I don't exactly know how he gets their essence from them, but go off, I guess. Also, the arcana we get in this stage is the big bomb or whatever, it's exactly what it sounds like. Okay, here's the rule I'm setting up. If a stage is barely changed at all besides the extra hidden room, I'm just going to talk about the Arcana on the stage. On the topic of Arcana, magic works a lot differently than it did for Shovel Knight. For one, it recharges automatically, since Plague Knight has no good way of refilling it, since he doesn't get trouble chalices. That is the only way it has changed. Spectre Knight stage gives you Leech Liquid. It takes a while to start, and if you're hit during that startup, it'll be cancelled, but if you pull it off for a short amount of time, you'll be able to gain health from every time you hit an enemy. It's okay, I guess I didn't use it nearly as much as the phase locket. And Spectre Knight gets as expected Knight. After beating those two levels, Plague Knight will drop down the screw lifts and meet Mona dancing. Yeah, this campaign is a lot more plot than the last one. If the plot of the last game was the stereotypical, you gotta save the girl kind of plot, then Plague of Shadows is the romantic comedy. Plague Knight is 
literally just the incarnation of, well, he's murdered a couple people, but he's just a silly little guy. He's so shy and nervous to ask her to dance with him, it's adorable. Anyway, onto the next couple of levels, which starting out with the Explodatorium again, has changed a little bit. Since this is literally his house, you arrive a few minutes after Shovel Knight does, but you beat him to the boss arena, just so things can work storyline-wise. The Staff of Surging is the arcana you get for this level, and I really like the consistency with Shovel of Hope, because this is garbage. It would be very good if you could use this in combination with all of your other movement options, but you can't, so it sucks. I guess it's fine if you need to attack an enemy above you, but it gets outclassed hard later in the game. The boss for the stage, since we are playing as Plague Knight, is Shovel Knight, which is really cool, and you can do pretty much everything you can do at that point in the game. Throw anchors, drink the Trouble Chalice, use the Flare Wand, pretty much everything. It's a really fun fight, and they even get around the problem of the guy you're fighting canonically winning, where instead of just having him be undefeatable, Plague Knight actually wins, but unfortunately for him, Shovel Knight wakes up and delivers a Charge Slash, sending him to the mat. He gets that essence later, though, don't you worry. Okay, so like, what is essence exactly? Because Shovel Knight just keeps it in a chest with him when he's asleep, and when he lost it, it nothing really happens to him? Is it like their soul or something? I don't really think you're supposed to question it, so I'm not going to anymore, because I think the answer might scare me. Also, unrelated, but I like to imagine Plague Knight winning this fight was just his accord of what happened here. Well, I technically beat him, but he got back up when I wasn't looking. Anyway, on to Treasure Knight now. Also, ignore my skin, I was getting that amiibo footage from earlier and couldn't figure out how to change it back, so he looks like a complete nub now. The arcana you get from this stage is the Vat. At a moment's notice, you summon a quick platform that you can stand on before it falls. Great for when you accidentally burst into a pit. The rest of Treasure Knight's stage just plays out the same. Before heading to Mole Knight once again, we might as well talk about some miscellaneous stuff. All of our wandering... Wandering warriors? Is that... That's not their name. I'm gonna say it anyways. All of our wandering warrior fights play out the exact same, except for you can recruit Baz into Plague Knight's army if you want. I love this goofball. And also the armor outpost. So you weren't allowed into the other village, and it's the same with the second one. Fortunately though, Percy has engineered a catapult that will take you straight to a completely unguarded armory, where they can take anything they want. Unfortunately, Percy and his dumb horse brain miscalculate it, and you get sent flying into the exact middle of town, where you have to fight a bunch of guards before taking it over. Now you can't buy armor here, but what you can buy instead is a trouble flask, which will let you speak to the trouble king finally. He's unwilling to aid Plague Knight because he's rotten, no good, and evil and all that, but, adorably, Plague Knight isn't really here for Ikor. He just wants to learn how to dance so he can be with Mona, and that's just... It, it, it's adorable. But also, the Trouble King is the person you buy all of your armors from, so I'll go over them real quick. The Treasure Trapings will let you drop less gold upon death, but also magnetizes treasure to you when holding burst. Pretty similar to Shovel Knight's red armor in the way that I'm never using it. The Goo Garments will let you do a Metroid Screw Attack wall jump. Yeah, you already know this is the best one. But let's get in here if I wanted it to. This is the only good option. The Ward Robe is literally just Shovel Knight's black armor. No knockback from foes, but you're slippery now. And Plague Knight was already very slippy, so I would not recommend this one at all. And finally, the Dandy Duds, which do nothing but look cool. Unlike your bomb upgrades, these can't stack, so pick wisely. Yeah, the wall jump one, obviously, who wouldn't want that? Also, before we head to Mole Knight, I wanted to point out that if you try to dance in front of Mona, he'll get really nervous and start tapping his fingers together. This is the best platform protagonist I've ever seen, that's ever been written, that's been ever made. Yacht Club, I wanna have your children. Anyway, Mole Knight's stage is practically identical, except for the segments where you ride this beetle across the lava. They can be almost entirely bypassed if you use the vat correctly in burst jumps. The item is the smoke bomb, it makes you invincible as long as you're within it. It sucks ass. Moving on. Before we go on to the next screen, let's revisit the Hall of Heroes since we're playing as Plague Knight now. So I mentioned this earlier, but Plague Knight and Shovel Knight's campaigns both happen around the same time, but they both keep passing each other over at certain points. Like Shovel Knight got to the armor outpost before Plague Knight came in and trashed the place, while Plague Knight just so happened to get to the Hall of Champions first, where in his version everything is fine, no ghosts at all. Except for Plague Knight is here to create some. <laughs> Self-defense walls. Anyhow, right after clearing those three levels, Mona asks for Plague Knight's help pulling the Essence Extractor lever because it's stuck, and right before they're about to hold hands and fix it, Percy, that cock-blocking asshole, comes in and does it. On to screen three! Tinker Knight is pretty much the exact same, but it really does remind me of a problem I have with almost all of these levels. They were simply not built for Plague Knight. I mean, like, obviously, but this level took me over half an hour because of how it was designed. So many tight corridors where I was forced to walk because simply, these are supposed to be Shovel Knight levels. It makes me very happy for the next two campaigns coming up, they changed their minds and decided to make brand new levels for Spectre Knight and King Knight. Plague Knight has such a fun way of controlling with his bursts that it makes me sad that I can't use them to its full potential. Allow me to use an example I thought of just now while editing this. Shovel Knight is like Mario and Plague Knight is like Sonic. Mario levels typically focus on being slower but with tighter platforming and Sonic levels being the opposite, mainly being bigger open levels with multiple branching pathways and a less focus on platforming and a bigger focus on just going 
going fast. And both of them work with each other. But now let's take Sonic from one of his games and put him into one of Mario's levels. He would struggle pretty damn hard, which is the problem I have with Plague of Shadows. You're taking a character that's made for speed and isn't exactly the best when it comes to precise platforming, and then putting him into levels where that exact thing is required. Especially with Tinker Knight as a boss himself. The hardest part about this boss is Shovel Knight was trying to actually reach him. It was a cool mix-up that no other boss had done up to that point, but Plague Knight can just simply jump up there. There's barely any challenge with him. Or how about the item you get in this stage, the Fleet Flask? It lets you run at stupidly high speeds, but besides a challenge level testing you on your ability to use it, it's barely ever practical. I mean, it's still fun to play around with, don't get me wrong, but it could have been so much cooler. I would go to Propeller Knight next, but Black Knight cock-blocked me on the world map, so we're heading to him next. But this time, when you start the fight, he's talking to Mona instead of whoever the hell it was the first time. She's wondering where she actually fits in a Plague Knight's plan, or if she's just being used to brew the potion of whatever Plague Knight called it. Plague Knight can't muster up a response because he's too embarrassed to share his feelings with her, so she runs off and we proceed to beat the absolute living shit out of Black Knight for being that guy. After this, they return to the lab and Mona isn't there. Just Percy again. I just love Mona and Plague Knight so much. Two lovers that have crushes on each other, but neither of them want to admit it to the other because they're too scared to admit their feelings because they don't know if the other feels the same. It's just, oh, I'm alive! Plague Knight is the epitome of just like me for real. He's adorable, they're adorable, this campaign is adorable, this is making me feel things, I love it. I will say this, it definitely has Shovel of Hope beat when it comes to story. I just feel so mushy inside playing this. Anyway, back to the levels again, and the flying machine gives you the Staff of Smacking, or whatever it was called. Incredible fast, close combat whacking. Good for those bosses that stay in one place for a few seconds so you can just whittle away at them. And Propeller Knight still turns me on, so off to Propeller Knight so we can end this. It gives you the stupid blue potion of uselessness, moving on. It makes you invincible, but only to enemies, so like, why even bother at that point? Look what they need to mimic a fraction of our power. But now that all of the Order of No Quarter has been defeated, plus Shovel Knight, we can finally make that ghastly brew Plague Knight has been dreaming of. But we need one final component, the essence of the Enchantress. So it's off to bust her up once again. Okay, one thing I'll definitely give to Plague of Shadows campaign is that the Enchantress Stage 1 is so much fun to speedrun. I got through this entire thing, including the boss, in 7 minutes because of how this boy can move. It was a blast. Also, something unrelated I didn't write down, but Plague Knight canonically fights Black Knight, then Shovel Knight fights him. If he wasn't on the Enchantress scoop when he summoned those wings, how did he do it? Like, maybe he just did that, I don't know. Which implies Plague Knight beat him up, then Shovel Knight did right after for no reason. Which makes his theme a billion times more badass. It's truly his last stance against you in the Enchantress. Plaguey and Blackout have a conversation right before his fight, where he tells Plague Knight that Mona was trying to negotiate a deal to get the Enchantress's essence to protect Plague Knight. She was doing all of this behind his back to protect him. They obviously fight, and Plague Knight steamrolls him, and he's convinced he needs the potion to earn her love when it's clear to Black Knight that she already loves him. So we press on, head through the second level, beat up everybody who we betrayed earlier, get dunked on by Shovel Knight a second time, and head on to the final level. I love how the first part with the blocks that fly towards you is the only applicable usage for the stupid blue potion I could find in the entire game. Really, the level leading up to the Enchantress is just a joke for Plague Knight, but the Enchantress herself is much harder, mainly because both you and the Enchantress can break the ground now, so you have to be careful on where and when you're throwing. It definitely makes it a lot spicier for a second time around, but she goes down all the same, and just kinda gives you her essence, because she knows if she keeps fighting, she'd have to deal with Shovel Knight at the same time who enters right after this. And finally, everything is set. Plague Knight has all of the essences he needs, and the potion is complete. But right before he's about to use it to make himself all powerful, Black Knight barges into the room with Mona, so she can explain how she already loves him, potion or not. But unfortunately, Black Knight was too late and the concoction destabilizes. Then we get some kind of freaky mental battle against a female version of Plague Knight. I kinda had to go to the bathroom, so luckily the boss was nice enough to not attack me and enter its second phase all by itself. And now it's time for the real final phase. You have to face this giant plague doctor, what you might call it. It went down in a minute. Did I hear Impact Fuse Cluster Powder Werewolf Casing anybody? You need to chip away at its chest so it'll open its mouth and expose its weak point, which is supposed to be difficult with the amount of bombs you need to chuck at it, but it's barely even an issue when you can just use the Cluster Powder. But now the thingamajig has been defeated and the potion stabilizes. Plague Knight can finally achieve his goal of becoming all-powerful, but he's decided he kind of already has everything he wants. He doesn't need a potion anymore. I mean, of course the world still hates alchemists, so Mona comes up with the idea of using it to blow up the Tower of 
fate, because why not? Their friend Black Knight is still definitely not in said tower, so they ditch the potion and run like hell as the tower collapses. Because fuck Black Knight. This also explains how the tower blew up, I guess. And we get a new casting call to round off the adventure. Spectre Knight seems pretty pissed about losing his amulet. What a crybaby. Mona and Plague Knight are free to do whatever they want now that people actually like them. They even get knighted by King Pride more. How cute. Oh look, they even go on a date on the flying machine. Is that Propeller Knight in a tuxedo? My god. And our final shot of the game is them both dancing in their laboratory. F***ing adorable. Overall, I really enjoyed Plague of Shadows. Definitely more complaints than Shovel of Hope. And as much as it pains me to say this, my least favorite campaign in the game. But it's really stiff competition, especially when you're given the short end of the stick like this. Plague Knight's levels simply weren't designed for him, which is something every other knight gets. I did enjoy the story and comedy a lot more than Shovel of Hope, though. Now, just because I said it was my least favorite doesn't mean I didn't enjoy it. When your competition is the Mona Lisa, one of the most tragic stories told in a video game in a Wario Land-like, of course I'm going to like you the least. Maybe in an alternate universe where he got unique level designs, altered bosses, and all of his arcana were actually good to use, this could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Shovel Bro. But as it is, it's just really good. Before heading on to our next campaign, I would like to sidetrack for a second and talk about Shovel Knight crossovers. Be because, oh my god, there is so many! Blaster Master Zero, Blasphemous, Brawlhalla, Get Out of My Head, Rivals of Aether, Fall Guys, Arby's, being a cameo or just being playable in all of them. Let's go through and rank a bunch of them for no reason whatsoever. I'll be awarding each game one to nine shovel coins based on how well I think it does at portraying him. We'll just be going over the playable appearances since those are more interesting to talk about. And I'm directly stealing from the wiki the list of playable appearances because I'm not questing them out myself. Only exceptions I'm making from this list. Star Mazer because it's a bad and where Indivisible's on this list for some reason, even though him being playable got cancelled. Fall Guys can't get footage of it because of how the shop works. And Brawlhalla, because I'm not installing that game, you can't make me. First off, we have Rumbo, and this is a pretty grim start. It's literally just a skin, but I'll give them props for at least giving him a befitting emote. Three out of nine shovel coins. Cook Serve Delicious has you unlock him through the stum wheel thing, and after trying this for half an hour, I gave up. The characters you unlock are barely even playable, you just select them from the start screen, and the rest of the gameplay is the same for every character. One out of nine shovel coins, it's just a PNG. Road Redemption is a step up though, because you can in fact see him. They also did go through a bit of effort to tweak his stats and give him a shovel. The only problem is I have to complete two runs of this game to unlock him and I don't feel like doing that, so 5 out of 9 shovel coins. Move or die, I physically cannot unlock him. <laughs> you have to unlock him through leveling up and I can't do that unless you play online with others. And these servers are barren. As it is, it's just another skin, so like 2 out of 9 shovel coins. Dino Run DX, he's not just a skin, you can equip but simply a hat. So I'll put him on the same level as the last game because at least I could actually play as him this time. 2 out of 9 shovel coins. Blaster Master Zero's Shovel Knight is by far the best one yet. This is just Shovel Knight. He can swipe, shovel pogo, throw his anchors, use the phase locket. This is just Shovel Knight inside Blaster Master Zero. 7 out of 9 shovel coins. Well done. Right back down to reality though. Runner 3's Shovel Knight is just a skin. At least it looks nice, so 3 out of 9. Indie Pogo though really pulled it off. He has the dust knuckles, propeller dagger, the warhorn. They even incorporated the fishing rod into his moveset. This really feels like Shovel Knight on a trampoline. 8 out of 9 shovel coins. Following up a good interpretation of Shovel Knight in a fighting game, we have Blade Strangers, which is a worse interpretation of Shovel Knight in a fighting game. Okay, it's worse representation of what Shovel Knight can do, but I think this is better because, god, it's funny. They even gave him a weird-ass Japanese voice. I love it. <laughs> 7 out of 9 shovel coins. Mutant Muds is yet another skin. I don't know why it's on this list. 2 out of 9 shovel coins. Rivals of Aether. Oh, how I've waited for this one. This is by far the best interpretation of Shovel Knight out of all of them, bar none. So many of his moves are represented one way or another here. And oddly enough, a lot of those moves are pulled directly from the Custom Knight. Yeah, you're at the present now, good job. The Toe Anchor is his up special, the Flare Rod is his back air, the Propeller Dagger that went upward is his up air. Even some of his regular relics, like the Dust Knuckles, can be used in the air and on the ground as his forward tilt. The regular Propeller Dagger is his side special, the Charged Shovel Slash is his forward strong, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure they referenced the Battletoads armor with his dash attack. And hitting the Taunt button will let you summon Chester to buy items from, like the Warhorn, the Mobile Gear, and a new creation specifically for this game, the Ghost Knuckles. You can even change your damn armor in the middle of a match. The silver armor will let you use the strongs in the air, the black armor will let you take less knockback, but just slide all over the place like Luigi in Melee, and even the pissing gold armor for shits and giggles. 9 out of 9 shovel coins, who also take this than rivals? Creepy Castle is just a skin, but this time it's Plague Knight instead, so I'll give you an extra point for being different. 3 out of 9 shovel coins. Give me a T, give me an H, I'm not spelling that entire thing, it's just a skin. 2 out of 9 coins. And to end this off, we have Rubber 
Bond, which is just another skin. I am so tired. To have nine coins, who cares? We're leaving. Okay, let's head back to actual Shovel Knight now. And when I say actual Shovel Knight, I mean the one campaign that doesn't feature him at all. Spectre of Torment. Long ago, these- You're gonna say that shit every time, aren't they? It's Spectre Knight's job to collect an army of invincible knights for the Enchantress and form the Order of No Quarter we have grown so attached to. So yes, this is a pretty cool prequel. With every member of the Order collected, an amulet he has grows stronger. Something something lore that isn't explained thoroughly and we're off to our first level. I suppose we'll keep up the tradition of explaining how the character plays in the first stage. So, Specky has a few tricks up his undead and disgusting sleeve. Instead of a shovel or bombs, he gets a scythe, which he can use to attack enemies and skateboard. He has a pretty basic scythe swipe, similar to Shovel Knight's stab. The only difference is Spectre Knights is faster. They're practically the same move, but in the air, he can use his scythe to slice through enemies and gain some height and distance. It doesn't matter if it's a lamp, bubble, or enemy, he can glide right through. He also has a wall run on non-slick surfaces, so grass is a no-go, but dirt is fine. He has the same magic meter as Plague Knight, except for this time it's darkness, so it doesn't regen. You need to hit foes so darkness can flow into you, like the orbs from the Chaos Armor. And that's pretty much all he brings to the table. Also, him jumping breaks blocks, but I forgot to mention it because of how useless it is 90% of the time. His moveset is simple, but that doesn't mean bad. Very fluid with how everything interconnects with each other. Wall jumping into an air slash never gets old. You might have also noticed this, but this entire level has been altered to play at Spectre Knight's strengths. But I really like the similarities to the Planes of Passage from the last two campaigns. The same, but different. It's really symbolic in some way my brain is too small to understand. In the same vein as that, Black Knight meets you at the end of the level where he looks like it's going to be his fight from the last games, but this time he breaks the floor and brings in his battle companion, Terrapin. His moves are exactly the same, but Terrapin mixes things up pretty well. When he fires his blast of energy, Terrapin can knock it back, basically making them play badminton with it, and generally just taking up space on stage. He actually almost got me, but luckily I'm so awesome and his attacks bounce off my super cool muscles and I won. We try to convince Black Knight to join our fan club, but he obviously doesn't want to because of the anti-hero thing, and he recognizes Spectre Knight's fighting style from somewhere as well. Referring to him as Donovan, yeah, I think you need your eyes checked, buddy. This is clearly Spectre Knight. He refuses to join and pisses off. And we are sent to our hub for the game, the Tower of Fate. Oh yeah, the Enchantress scolds you or like something, but the Tower of Fate. Instead of an overworld, Spectre of Torment gets this little hub he can walk around. Buying new robes, increasing your darkness, getting new items, all here. Including a bunch of funny stuff like dropping candles on gold armors for no reason. Relics, previously referred to as Arcana, now known as Curios, can be purchased from this guy here, known as Red. So you no longer get specific items from different stages, you can instead purchase them in any order you want to from this handful it gives you. I said you three times in that sentence, didn't I? It's really nice and open feeling with the amount of freedom this gives. On the topic of freedom, Spectre of Torment lets you choose any stage you want to go to in any order from this mirror here. I love the non-linearity that really mixes up the formula we've gotten used to. Well, so let's mix things up and go from left to right, and befittingly going to the Lich Yard first. So this goes for all of the stages, but all of them have changed drastically for Spectre Knight. Instead of being a graveyard, it's a little town now. Every stage has its own new gimmicks as well. Instead of the weighted platforms and bushes of before, we now have fire that needs to be extinguished and invisible platforms. The darkness is still here though, because it's a lich yard. I think the platforms of wall magically appearing right as he touches them is a cool idea, but I cannot get behind the extinguishing fire. I fell in the same pit like 15 times because of it, it's way too annoying. Every level also gets a new theme in the background, so this is practically an entire new game. And if you ask Yacht Club, it is because they sell it separately for $10. Aside from that, all of the suspects you'd expect are here. Skeletons, big skeletons, ghosts, the usual. What's new is the boss, however. Predictably, Spectre Knight can't be our boss because he's too lovable to hurt, so it's the Phantom Striker residing here instead. It's pretty much the same fight from the last two campaigns, but this time he can summon down extra thunder. Cool, I guess. And he refuses to join the order. I am so happy the Enchantress isn't keeping tabs on us right now because we are going 2-0. I also got 6,000 gold right after this level, and I immediately rushed to buy the rail mail cloak. It lets you grind on any surface with the scythe like City Escape from Sonic Adventure 2. This is genuinely the best armor out of any of these campaigns. I do not care. This makes him a billion times funner to play as. Tony Hawk's Spectre of Torment. I'm not even talking about the other cloaks yet. This one is just mandatory. What better place to go test out our new skateboard on than the Clockwork Tower? So here we are at Tinker Knight's little powwow, and goddamn do they improve the music for this one a lot.
It's also a lot prettier this time around. The tower isn't complete since this took place like a month before the events of Shovel of Hope, so we get to see the outdoors a bit and it looks gorgeous. Real pixel art eye candy. I've always been a fan of the early morning, but not quite sunrise aesthetic, so it's really doing it for me. The gimmicks this time are also a lot of fun. The guys who throw gears last time serve a bigger purpose than just being a cool hazard. You can swipe at their gears to send them into the sky so you can slash them. That's a really neat way to use those projectiles. There's now also platforms you can stand on that'll rise other platforms of the same area. Not nearly as cool, but still interesting. Wow, cool puzzle. It'd be a shame if I bypass the entire thing with my awesome rail grinding. Perfect time to bring up that if you want to increase your maximum darkness and health, you'll need to find these little stations in the levels. Don't worry too much if you miss one. There's a lady in the hub that'll sell them to you if you don't find them. On the topic of how much I love this level, Tinker Knight has a new boss where he's not a complete joke. His first phase actually has him being competent with what he's doing, using the mobile gear that Shovel Knight had and riding around the area, even creating spikes at certain points on it that need to be wall jumped over. It's actually a really fun fight, and complemented beautifully by his second phase, where instead of hopping in the drill machine, it chases you through the wall and he flies around it. So it's similar to the first fight where you need to jump up there and hit him, but it's different in the way that you need to watch the floor for holes, and carefully platform your way up there. Probably one of my favorite fights in the whole game. So far, this is incredible, but he gets smacked up and joins the order. No matter what, after defeating two bosses, this little fade out will play, and we get a different scene of two adventurers going along the plains. Luan and that Donovan figure we had heard about earlier. This mysterious Donovan figure plays shockingly close to how Spectre Knight does. Probably just lazy game developers. You and Luan have to climb up the Tower of Fate. Up there lies some kind of amulet of power, the same one that Shovel Knight and Shield Knight were trying to get. Luan is a father, and the amulet is promised to protect his son from all harm. All of this just to prevent child-proofing our house, dude. You get a curio exclusive to here, though. A cow drops, drop them on the ground, they do one damage, are useless. And they decide to stop at the same balcony Spectre Knight broods at. And that's the end of the story for now. I have no idea what any of that meant onto the next stage. So Pride More Castle hasn't actually received a ton of changes. They didn't actually use any new gimmicks for this one, ignoring all the enemies being brand new. Okay, well obviously propeller rats are reused, but how can you replace such an icon? New variants of the gold armors that have ball and chains, versions of the wisdoms that shoot skulls, and that combined with the brighter aesthetic and cheerier music is honestly enough for me. I mean, a new level layout is enough, really. But it feels a lot more welcoming in a way than the last time we went to Pridemore Castle. In Shovel of Hope, it felt like we were climbing a mountain that we were unwelcome in. But in Spectre of Torment, it feels like we're coming back home after a long trip. It's just nice and warm feeling for me. That might also be because we don't actually recruit King Knight. He's already a part of the Order. We're just kind of here to tell him to get his shit together and actually contribute to the team. So far, we have fought four people and recruited one of them. I am so fired. This new version of King Knight is actually really fun to fight. I mean, for this video, I've had to fight King Knight like eight times now, so it's really nice that they've changed practically everything, starting when he does a slam attack onto the ground that is supposed to stun and instead breaks the floor creating pits. This is probably because like the Clockwork Tower, this place is currently under construction. I should have brought this up a minute ago, but it was really cool seeing the parallels between Shovel Knight and Spectre Knight's trip through Primor Castle. Now King Knight himself can actually fall in these holes, but if he does so, he'll just ride out on some propeller rats, and then he'll throw cards all over the place. I would say this will make more sense later, but the name of his campaign is King of Cards, so like... You can kind of guess what it's gonna be about. It's a simple fight, but what do you really expect from King Knight? King Knight starts doing his damn job again, and we're out. Before we can head on to our next level, though, we get a surprise visit from somebody I've barely talked about. Reese bursts into the room, coming to beat up all of the bad guys and such. Spectre Knight tries to get him to leave peacefully, despite never meeting this child before. And the Enchantress comes in the room and covers him in darkness goop. And a fight breaks out, and honestly, the shower Reese is really hard. Like, he kicked my ass on the first try, he's tough. But we obviously win, because if we didn't, this would be a very short campaign. And he's our new portal guy despite Spectre Knight's resolve. On to the Stranded Shipyard. Aesthetically, this one has changed drastically, going from the previous outside and stranded ship to a frozen palace of sorts. Honestly, I like it a lot, but there's only so much I can say about these stages aesthetically and how they've changed without sounding like a broken record. So on to the new gimmicks, all of which I'm a fan of. You have these rails you can grind across. This is where you're supposed to be introduced to rail grinding, but you already know how that went. The blue ones will send you to the right, and the red ones will send you to the left. On top of that, there are switches that will switch which walls are where. Then you combine that with the buttons also changing which way the rails send you, and you have quite a mighty fine gimmick right here. I mean, it's a level built around my favorite gimmick in the whole game. Of course I love it. There's not a lot else I can say besides it's just a very well put together stage. Polar Knight has changed, but not that much. I mean, his boss is now the only one that lets you move the screen, which is cool, I guess. All he really does is drop icicles down that'll create platforms you just stand on. Great stage, okay boss, I have no segue whatsoever, so onto the Explodatorium. Probably the least changed stage out of all of them. The music is, like the others, a remix of the original theme, but this time it just kind of sped up. I mean, it sounds good, but don't get me wrong, but it's just not that different. Also, also not that different is the aesthetics, being just brighter. Really, it's like Pridemore Castle in a lot of ways, but King Knight's was always 
supposed to be basic, and it only really has, like, one new gimmick, which is just water that moves you along. Yippee! Water! I don't know, probably my least favorite stage so far. It was at least fun to skateboard through, I'll give it that. Not even Plague Knight can make up for it, sadly. The only new thing he has is clones, which isn't even inspired by his campaign. Consequentially, because of how nothing this stage was, I don't have a ton to say about it. So you know what? We're moving on. I hope something more interesting happens in the next two seconds. Dang it, that was three. We cut back to Luan and Donovan, who are now climbing to the summit of the tower. It's honestly just really cool seeing how they reimagined the hub into a level. Even if it was short, it was a lot of fun. They finally make it to where the amulet is, and right before they're about to grab it, Shield Knight comes out of nowhere and tells them not to touch it. A little hypocritical, considering she 100% touches it three minutes later. Donovan, being an absolute bastard, goes against Luan's wishes of hearing her out, and starts fighting her. It's really cool for the first time we actually get to beat the shit out of Shovel Knight's wife. It's a pretty good fight. She'll shield attacks from the front, semi-obviously, throw her shield like a frisbee and charge at you like she's holding a riot shield. This is genuinely a really good boss fight, but she goes down pretty easily. The tower starts collapsing somehow and Luan tells Donovan that they should leave immediately and Don being a bastard hits him out of the way and tries to grab the amulet at the last second, but fails and they both fall down. So back to Spectre Knight now. I should go on to the next level, but I want to instead talk about the Tower of Fate itself for a little bit. I briefly mentioned everything here earlier, but there's a ton more happening than I let on. First off, let's go over all the curios you can get. They can be purchased from this guy here called Red in exchange for Red Skulls. The reason he wants them is because he's looking for his lost wife, who is a Red Skull. Those things are just scattered all over the levels. You've probably already seen me collect one at this point in my footage. It's the same deal as the Cypher Coins, but less of them. Let's go down the list of all of the purchasable curios. First off, we have the Throwing Sickle. Pretty basic right in front of you projectile. The Dread Talon, a close swipe that takes a minute or two to start, but when it does, does two damage, so it's worth it. Barrier Lantern, a shield that makes you invincible to all enemies and projectiles, but it won't work against spikes and hazards like the lava buckets from Pride More. And once it's taken enough hits, it can be shot out as a powerful projectile. Pretty good, even though I barely used it. Bounding Soul, or bound, I don't know, there was a typo in my script, I don't remember its actual name. Pretty basic projectile that bounces. Judgment Rush, it's like the one thing he does from his boss fight. He'll charge it up and then fly towards the nearest enemy me. Skeletal Sentry. It's some skeleton that shoots arrows at things. I never use this. Next. Spider Scythe. It's like the Bounding Soul, but it'll stick to walls and such. Will Skull. Clutch this skull and regain will. I stole that description, but that is exactly what it does. What more can I say? Shadow Mirror. Like the Shadow Knight from the Amiibo guy from earlier. It'll make another Spectre Knight appear in front of you that can attack on your behalf. Good for those far away foes, I guess. Hover Plum. It'll let you float. This thing made the flying machine bearable. And finally, the Kronos Coin. Slows down time for a little bit. Pretty useful on all. I used pretty much every curio that was on offer pretty regularly. I mean, obviously the Skeletal Sentry and the Shadow Mirror aren't as useful, but I still used them. I mean, hell, Shovel Knight had relics I didn't use too often, so pretty good curio selection. None of the curios felt useless like Plague Knight's Arcana. Moving slightly to the right here, we have Manny, who will sell you new cloaks. You have to throw a bunch of money in this pot for him to appear, but he... they... Those? We'll show up and set up shop. All right, let's go over all the cloaks, fine. Cloak of Clemency, instead of dying when you fall into a pit or touch spikes, you'll just lose a bunch of will and darkness. Also drop less gold when you die, it's practically tradition at this point. I've already gone over the godsend, that is the rail mail, so moving right along to the striker's shawl. Hold the attack button to release a charged scythe slash. Pretty basic, but useful, I guess. Remnant of Risk. Break checkpoints to lower your max will, but boost your attack and regenerate darkness until you fall in battle. That sounds awful. And finally, the ghostly garb. It breaks the tradition of the useless armor being gold, but they had a good reason to do so this time. That's because he does the damn walk from Symphony of the Night. I love video games. All of these armors are pretty cool. Rail mail, use the rail mail. There are no other good options, just use the silver one. God, so much talk has been on this one screen. Let's see what's upstairs. We have a dining hall where you can talk to a bunch of those NPCs, including whatever knight you recently recruited. We have a library where you can consistently f with this one gold armor for no reason. But in the same room is another one of those things you can fill up to some of the dudes. These fellows will upgrade any curio you have, being pretty simple, straight to the point upgrades. The dread talon will become invincible and increase in range. The shadow mirror will go farther and pick up items. The will skull gives more health. Pretty basic stuff, but all useful. Finally, for the exterior of the tower, there's obviously Spectre Knight's Depression Balcony, but there's also a rail grinding area if you want to dick around for two minutes. And attention to detail I really like about the balcony is the more knights you recruit, the more stuff will be in the background. Like the flying machine moves in, Mole Knight's Volcano, Volcanoes. And Polar Knight brings an Aurora Borealis localized entirely in our balcony. Third time I've referenced steamed hams in this video. <laughs> now just because this is practically a hub world doesn't mean there aren't any secret areas you can find. Like at the rail area, there's the... 
Oh no. Okay, I don't know if this has a name, but I'm going to be calling it the Trial Tower from now on. This stupid piece of shit, dumb dumb <laughs> idiot, stupid tower is essentially a roguelike. See how far you can get until you win. The only thing that really increases is your skill. It's random every time you go up, and dear god, this took me so long to do. And I have played this game before. Try to imagine how it looked for me on my first try. There's not even a good reward for doing it. It's just a stupid achievement in 1700 gold. I hate this stupid tower. It's why I do it every playthrough. All of this personality really makes the Tower of Fate feel like more than just a hub area. It's sometimes fun to just roam around here and screw off into the next level. He doesn't get an overworld, but honestly, this is a good trade-off. It also really drills in the fact that he can never leave until he's done with his mission. So let's continue on that mission with the Lost City. I actually like Spectre Knight's trek through here a lot because you actually start on the outside of the Lost City and make your way in, unlike Shovel Knight who starts a little bit into it. This can be seen as A, a way to spice up the level and show some parts of it we never saw before, or B, Yacht Club not wanting to waste the background of the Kratos fight so they create an entire outside section for the stage. Both equally likely, but the outside parts are really cool though. It spices up the stage a lot visually. They also don't introduce any new gimmicks with this stage, instead expanding off the ones of last time. There are blocks of slime you can jump off of now, obviously the lava rivers can be turned into slime still, and the lanterns can be covered in it instead of slicing right through, you'll bounce off, which is used for some great puzzles going on. Great level all around. Even Mole Knight gets in on the slime action. It'll start out the same, but then when he does that big lava flare attack, he'll cover himself in the goop, making everything he does bouncy. He'll go through the ceilings as well as the walls, and when he pops out, he'll bounce. It's it's a really cute way to tie the stage gimmick into the boss. But that's really it for the Lost City. Time for the second to last level. The Iron- Oh, for the love of God! I love this scene because you don't even fight Baz, he just leaves, it's hilarious. Okay, but actually time for the Iron Well now. You know the drill, new gimmicks, new aesthetics, new music that absolutely slaps. I don't understand how they made one of the best tracks go even harder, but here we are. New thing to play around with this time is the aqua bubbles that always stay at the top of the water. You can move them and slash through them for extra height. Pretty basic stuff. And adding on to that is the tide that rises up and down. So you're not submerged in water the entire level, you go in and out of it for puzzles. And it works really well in my opinion. I'm running out of ways to say I like things, so Treasure Knight. Treasure Knight, like Mole Knight, plays around with his gimmick of the level and his boss. He'll lower the water level throughout the fight, making him play completely differently. His slams now put coins everywhere that slash across the ground instead of big waves of money. His grapples don't go as far because he doesn't have puddles to play around in. It's a really fun fight in all honesty, but that doesn't make it a hard one. He goes down to the map pretty easily. Finally, we can move on to the flying machine and- God damn it! Last we left off with our good pal Donovan and Luan falling into a hole, and now we're back up with Luan being dead and Donovan being not far from it. Off to a great start already, but then the Enchantress comes in from nowhere and hits him with the Hey, bring me eight knights for my order and I'll make you not die, lol. With not a lot of options, Donovan accepts and is given a scythe along with armor to go out on his quest. Oh my god! Shield Knight was the Enchantress the whole time?! Yeah, if you didn't already guess, Donovan and Spectre Knight are the same person. They literally show this in the intro cutscene. So in their quest for protecting Luan's son, they have both died, gotten repossessed, and created one of the greatest that's the plane has ever seen. Great. Don't skateboard away from me, young man, I'm talking to you. Time to finish off the grunt gathering with the flying machine. This has barely changed, the music is the same as sped up. Holy shit, I'm slicing through those cannonballs, this is raw as fuck. Yeah, I'm sorry it ends on a note like this, but I have really nothing to say. It's just the flying machine. Uh, again. Propeller Knight himself has also not changed. But the arena has. Yeah, it lures you into a full sense of security when nothing's changed at the start, but then the cannon ship flies into the background and just bombs the entire stage. This time his fight is taking place on top of a bunch of aircrafts, and honestly, really cool. A short fight, but a good one. Also, his rose is missing, wonder what happened to that. But now that seven members of the Order of No Corner have been gathered, we can finally look for an eight. Yeah, you know it's going to be Spectre Knight, we just don't know how yet. We return to the mirror room, and for the love of God, if people would stop breaking in here, I really hope the Enchantress got insurance. Black Knight breaks in and tries to save Shield Knight from the tower, not realizing she's already far too gone, and Spectre Knight hears the fact that his boss is the same lady who got him into this mess in the first place, and Donovan is out for blood. Also, the old mirror dude is back, hooray! I don't know why he offers to operate the portal for us when we jump into a hole to start our quest, but sure, why not, alright. Enchantress Stage 1, for the most part, pretty much does exactly what all of Shovel Knight's Enchantress stages did, but this time all wrapped up into one level, and even combining the gimmicks so you get the rushing water of the Explodatorium, combined with the jumping plants of the Lich Yard. The darkness also from the Lich Yard, combined with Polar Knight's rail grinding. Or how about the water and that big fish from Treasure Knights combined with the appearing platforms from... 
Mm, the Lich Yard. Yeah, big Lich Yard focus, but considering we're playing as the main boss of that stage, I'll let it pass. I could say this ties into how Spectre Knight, even though he's different, is still intertwined with the Order and can never really get away from them, but that's stupid and dumb, so we're moving on. Black Knight shows up at the end of the stage as an attempt to stop us, but yeah, you already know how that goes. I like his new attacks, though. Terrapin flying around is a cool new addition. Spectre Knight finishes them off and drops Terrapin to the bottom of the tower because he's a bastard. I can excuse murder, but I draw the line of animal cruelty. On to Enchantress Stage 2. Sorry if I'm being buried to the point, I'm sick while scripting this and I don't have a good excuse past that. The reason every gimmick is rolled into one for that stage is because there are only two Enchantress stages, and the second one obviously being the final boss. So let's finally end this journey and cry during the end credits. I love this building up to the boss, how both Shovel Knight and Plague Knight both went downwards from here, and if you play both of their campaigns, you're expecting the same thing, but instead you go upwards. If I'm being real, that got a chuckle out of me. Anyway, you find the Enchantress in the same room you found the amulet in and a brawl breaks out. It's pretty much the same fight we've gotten two times already, but this time the stage you fight on is new. Instead of the ground being breakable at the start, she progressively starts replacing more and more of it with breakable blocks, until the end of the fight is completely comprised of them. But yeah, it's literally the same fight we've done two times up to this point, moving on. The Enchantress goes on about how we're a weakling and that she could easily defeat us before immediately leaving and making someone else fight in her stead. She calls Reese's peanut butter cup into the room so she can play with her toys again, and she turns race car into this giant ass terrifying abomination mech thing. There's only one thing that can save us now, skateboarding. Okay, when do they have time to install this? Like, I know the Enchantress changed the tower a lot since she took over, but genuinely, when did she install a skate park? The boss fight against Shadow Reese is honestly a blast. This might just be because of the spectacle of rail grinding as the final boss, but uh, shut up, it's my video. Aside from some tricky slashes off some lanterns, this is really not that hard of a boss. Kind of disappointed, honestly, with how easy it is, but hey, it looks really cool. All it really does is just shoot down fire and charge towards you, but damn it, man, you're skateboarding the whole fight. How can I complain about that? Both Plague of Shovels and Shadow of Hope had a better final boss, but this one sticks in my mind way more. Well, Race got the beat down, and the Enchantress decides, hey, that guy would be a great last addition to our order, and starts powering up the amulet to bring Donovan back to life. But before she blasts him with it, Donovan pipes up, and he begs her to use it on Reese instead, saying he'll become the final knight of the order. And she agrees, Donovan taking the amulet that was supposed to be used on him and directing it at Reese instead, saving his life and forever being trapped as Spectre Knight. With his one final act of free will, he takes him and leaves the Tower of Fate. And that's the end! King Knight starts goldifying Pridemore Castle, the army of the undead starts destroying the Lich Yard, causing the villagers to flee, Propeller Knight takes over the skies, the armor outpost is overrun, the swords that the knights once had get turned to those stupid little missile things from the Clockwork Tower. This is not a happy ending. Nobody won in this, except for the Enchantress. Donovan lost his humanity, best friend, pretty much everything. In the pursuit of everything, he lost it all. Our final shot of the clip reel ending credits is Spectre Knight leaving Reese with the hedge farmers, and Spectre Knight is left to forever remain in the Lich Yard. And when I say forever, I mean like a week. I'm breaking the mood real quick. So the Order of No Quarter is established right after the Enchantress gets created, and the Enchantress was born around the same time Shovel Knight went into retirement. But as soon as the Order was created, he came back to doing hero stuff so he could stop them. And since Shovel Knight takes a nap after every Order of No Quarter stage, that means the events of Shovel of Hope and Plague of Shadows took place over the span of a little under two weeks. Enchantress, honey, baby, darling, your Order of Invincible Knights lasted a fortnight. Hey, is that why Propeller Knight mentioned a battle royale on the boss rush? But now that I have completely ruined the mood, after all of the credits, we get one final shot of Luan and Donovan before any of this happened. Luan is scared for his son's life with the reckless road he's going down. He throws Donovan an amulet. It was once a family heirloom, and Luan considers Donovan family. Donovan promises that no matter what happens, he will protect Reese. This final shot here is absolutely perfect. Them both sitting by the fire as the Tower of Fate, which would be both of their final resting places, looms in the background. I don't even have anything funny to say for this, it's just sad. Spectre of Torment's story is just perfect and sad and dark and it made me depressed, it was so... So good! For a reason, this is a lot of people's favorite campaign. Plague of Shadows and Shovel of Hope are like two sides of the same pie. One of them had better movement than the other, the other had better relics than the other, one of them had better story than the other, but the other one was more original. Spectre of Torment is the entire bakery. I mean, if I really tried to come up with some complaints of Shovel of Hope, I could. Without relics, Shovel Knight is kind of sluggish, it relied way too much on instant kill pits and spikes. 
Okay, well, two, but you get my point. Spectre of Torment, I genuinely cannot come up with anything I didn't like. Like, I guess the Railmail was really the only armor I needed, so switching to other armors was never required. But do you really want me to complain about Spectre Knight shredding on his own scythe? Spectre of Torment might just be the perfect platformer. The movement, the story, the bosses, the levels, the gimmicks, the abilities, the side content, the everything. Spectre of Torment, it's probably the best platformer of the 2010s. Second best. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is finally time for me to talk about my favorite Shovel Knight campaign. Shovel Knight King of Cards. Long ago, a new game is sweeping the lands known as Joustus, becoming a hot new trend among pretty much everybody, and King Knight wants in on it. Not for the fun of it, but for the glory. Whoever defeats the three Joustus kings earns some kind of huge prize, and King Knight isn't just gonna sit by and not know what it is. It's time for him to start his Joustus journey. But before we play cards, we need to go through the actual first level. Yeah, it's the plane the game. Again, who's all coming? Early morning, but before sunrise aesthetic. Early morning, but before sunrise aesthetic save me. So as I mentioned way earlier, King of Cards is a Wario Land-like. Not anywhere matching the speeds of Anton Blaster Pizza Tower, though. Closer to how Wario Land 1 through 3 played. His shoulder bash will be your main method of doing pretty much everything. If you bash an enemy or wall that isn't a slick surface, you'll slam into it and go spinning into the air. And from this, you can poke onto other enemies or destructible things and drill into dirt mounds, because he has no way of digging them up otherwise. Alternatively, if you don't want to deal with all of that, you can hit the attack button again to go into a roll. This is faster for just general mobility because he doesn't stop in the air at the end of it, and it also does some extra damage, but is also more uncontrollable, unlike the regular dash who are unable to cancel it in the air, and you won't pogo off of enemies. But that's really all he can do. All of his other abilities just come from the environment around him and how he allows you to interact with it. Bashing off of enemies to break things, slamming into walls so you can pogo onto stuff, rolling through armored enemies. What he can do might seem simple, but there is a lot of nuance underneath the surface, which by far makes it my favorite knight to play as. A Spectre Knight in close second. Maybe if Spectre Knight was a delf like King Knight, I would like him more. But that pretty much wraps up how he controls and one... dash... One. Okay, the elephant of the room. So King of Cards is more of a traditional platformer, taking more of a Mario 3 route with the levels instead of Mega Man. Each screen is comprised of around like 12 bite-sized levels instead of two to three big ones. So how am I going to talk about the levels? I consider talking about each and every one of them because this is my favorite campaign, but the first two didn't end up being that memorable like at all. So I'm going to be talking about the areas as a whole and I'll also be talking about levels I think stand out. So like two of these overall. Also, after the first two levels, we get to speak to King Knight's mom. He is not a real king. He lives with his mom. His subjects are rats. God, I don't want to fuck him. On to level three now, we get our feet a little wet with the Lich Yard. We run into our good old friend Spectre Knight. He promises he'll teach us the true meaning of pain before he gets absolutely curve stomped. And he hands over us a Joustus deck and tells us to play our role. Which I assure you, King Knight is very good at rolling. So we can finally go actually start our Joustus journey. Let's head down to the old Joustus house and I'll explain how the game works. So Joustus is predictably a card game. Each card has an arrow on it or several that lets it push other cards. The reason you need to push cards is so that you can push them onto gems, and whoever has the most gems when the board fills up wins. A deceptively simple game, but an addictive one. I love Joustus so much, one of my favorite parts of his campaign overall. Now Joustus isn't just for fun, it's also for keeps. Whoever wins a Joustus match gets to take one of their opponent's cards, including you. If you lose, you can just deadass lose a card. Now if you lose a card, you can buy it back from Chester, so it isn't completely unfair. On the topic of Chester, he sells you things that can assist you in Joustus matches. I would like to draw a comparison to the YouTuber Dream for what Chester lets you do. Dream is beloved by millions for his eccentric personality, friendliness towards kids, and great content. So what Chester can do for you is a lot similar to that. Cheating. You can buy cheat cards for him that let you rig matches in your favor. Like one that lets you turn all of your opponent's cards into Beatos, one that lets you play all of your cards at once, and another one that just gives you all of the gems of the board because why not? Now that doesn't mean your opponent can't cheat. Every Joustus house has a Joustus boss you can fight. You need to defeat every other player first, but after finding and defeating them, you can brawl with the boss. Staying with tradition, it's of course Black Knight, who funnily enough summons in Terrapin to be his table, which is just stupid. His special cheat is that he can summon now meteor showers, and I don't know if the AI was just being funky for me, but this is the most trigger-happy Joustus player I've ever seen. He often just started using them against himself, like what is his deal? After defeating every Joustus player in the building, that including a little child that only has Beto cards, you're met by that one rooster guy I forgot the name of in the bar outside. They lament about how cool you are and that you're definitely their number one pick for a Shovel Knight Smasher Pass. And maybe let's slip in there that they're also after the Joustus crown and need somebody who is a master at the game. 
game. So they let you crash on their airship, as all of you make your way to King Pridemore in order to battle him. World 1 comprises pretty much entirely of Pridemore Keep and the Lich Yard. It isn't just entirely reused stuff spread throughout different levels though. They introduce new stuff as well that plays at King Knight's specific skills, like this purple goop in the Lich Yard you can't jump out of, so you need to strategically use your shoulder bashes to gain height. And in the Pridemore half of the map, there are springs you can bounce off of for extra height. The game kind of plays out like this. You have a level of everything from Plague and Spectre Knight's campaigns rolled into one, with introducing some new things inside of them, mainly just new enemies. Then from there are entirely unique stages throwing in new things at you. Usually stages have one checkpoint per level, and with a bunch of propeller rats taking you back to the ship. And since this game is more similar to Mario 3 and World than the others, the game gives you secret exits to some stages, usually designated by a red signpost and a fun little jingle. Those secret exits typically take you to some cool new area, and sometimes give you a new toy to play around with. Relics, then changed to Arcana, formerly known as Curios, now officially known as Heirlooms, are the thingies King Knight gets to play around with. There are some you can get from levels designated to them, and some you can get from buying them on the airship. Heirlooms can be purchased from all around the place, usually requiring Merit Medals. Merit Medals are pretty much just the green stars from Mario 3D World, three per level, and you can buy things with them, like the Rat Bombarder for two Merit Medals. You can throw a rat which will run across the ground destroying anything it jumps into. If you don't like where it's going, you can change its direction by hitting the rat button again. Or if you want to send the bomb farther, right after throwing it out, you can shoulder bash into it, sending it flying. There's so many things you can do with just one rat. And then there's the dueling glove. Yeah, remember the Staff of Striking from Plague of Shadows? Yeah, it's literally just that. And the turncoat lets you roll through enemies. And when it gets hit by literally anything, it'll start charging up a blast that gets progressively more powerful the greater amount of hits it's taken, eventually firing out a giant instant kill blast. Very good for things that have shields or lots of health like the Griffoths and gold armors. And past that, there are also the heirlooms that can be purchased from the ship. Also, by the way, the name of the ship is the Glidewing. I completely forgot to like mention that. The healing hammer is exactly what it sounds like. It's a hammer that when you hit an enemy, it drops hearts. I think that they just put this in the game because they wanted to to have King Knight use a giant cartoony ass hammer. And the propeller Blitzsteg. It's those enemies from Pridemore Castle that have jousting lances, except they're now in torpedo form. I forgot to bring it up earlier, but King Knight's magic or vigor, as the game now calls it, works identically to Shovel Knight's, except for it looks different visually. Let's talk about the final things you can do in the ship before I move back to talking about the levels. To the left here is the giant propeller thingamajig, and also the lady who will upgrade your bash, giving its spin magnetic properties to gold, and one that lets you hold down to cry. Like Spectre Knight, you can find whoever you last fought in the upper deck area, we're all happy to play Joustus with you, such as Baz and the Phantom Striker. Both are fought in this first area as well. The Phantom Striker fight is pretty much just the same as Spectre Knights, but they changed Baz a lot. He has this new somersault move where he'll bounce all around the arena covered in electricity. Cool take on an old fight, I like it a lot. Also playing Joustus with these guys gives you a chance to steal their special card, which it literally just has their face on it. The ape inside my brain wants me to collect all of them even though it's really unnecessary. Hell, you could go through the entire game without even touching Joustus. I mean, the speedrun doesn't even enter the Joustus house, they just go there and immediately leave. I like how it's up to you if you want to play the best platformer ever made, or the best platformer ever made with funny dumb cards. World 1 is simply supposed to be a tutorial world, so predictably, I don't have a lot to work with here. I don't have a ton of talking points, so let's head to King Pridemore. Much like every other boss across the campaigns, Pridemore has a stage leading up to him, and it's honestly kind of disappointing to me. I'm just saying it would have been way cooler if it started out with the exact same route Shovel Knight and Plague Knight took, but instead of it being under construction like in Spectre Knight's campaign, what if it was the start of Shovel Knight's version of the stage, but pretty soon into it, he finds a shortcut to get him there faster. That way, them not introducing any new gimmicks to the stage would be a lot more excusable, because it's the same route, but different. I don't know, I'm not a game designer, or this works too. But actually, on to Pridemore now. You see, all the challenge said was that you had to defeat the Joustus judges. It never said how. So yeah, he results to beating the shit out of him. But King Pridemore doesn't just sit there and take it. No, he fights back with his giant-ass suit of armor. It's awesome. He has the gold armor spike balls. He summons in Gripoths to shoot fireballs. He he even does a version of King Knight's Staff Strike. It's an awesome fight. A piss easy one, but a cool one nevertheless. And Pride Moore is defeated, giving us a ride on his super cool birds. He gives us some kind of big speech that King Knight predictably tunes out, and we're headed back to the Glide Wing. Pride Moore now joining us up there. He isn't there just to f your mom. He also sells armor. And for the first time, it's actually a toss up of what I think is the best one. For the final time, let's rattle off all the armors you can get. The lightweight plate allows you to hold the attack button to run. That's really it, but moving faster by default is obviously good. Vestments of Vigor. 
vigor. If you damage an enemy while you have this on, it gives you four vigor. So it's great if you want to spam heirlooms like a maniac. Battery Brigadine. Okay, that 100% made up that word so it could rhyme. Hold the attack button to get a farther reaching bash. And the real kicker is you can angle it in any direction. Angling it down is kind of useless, but can allow for some extra height if you point it upwards. Also very good armor. Rodent Regalia. I swear to god, somebody at Yacht Club absolutely sucked ass at these games because there is four armor sets that make you lose less gold and you die. And it also saves you from pits like Spectre Knights. I mean, at the same time, I would be upset if it wasn't there because it's tradition at this point. And finally, the Resplendent Cape. Completely useless, but it looks cool. I love his strut when he wears this. Honestly, what is the best armor is kind of a toss-up. I mean, for speedrunning, they typically go with the battery, whatever it was called. But my personal favorite, it's kind of all over the place. The lightweight plate is great for crossing bigger gaps and going faster. The battery stupid dumb made-up word is great for extra height and mobility. The vestments of vigor is really good for bosses and heirloom spam. The Rodent Regalia is there. I would probably say the battery, whatever it was called, is probably the best one, but my personal favorite is between the Run Button and Heirloom Expamington. But now that we're done with Pride More, we can move on to the next world and take down the next King of Joustus, being the Trouble King. And since the boss is the Trouble King, we get stages based off the Trouble Pond, like the first level of the new world that introduces a few new gimmicks. The Bubble Frogs that'll float above you, but if you go underneath of them, they'll pop and jump down. Or the Grass Platforms that as soon as you step off of them will disintegrate. They're pretty simple, but mesh really well well together since the frogs can also remove the platforms. Also, this secret room can kiss my ass. Now that we're done with that, we can head on to the next Jousts house because I might be addicted. So this house of jousting takes place inside of the Lost City or whatever Mole Knight's area was called. Pretty standard jousting affair, but we're introduced to some new card types here too. I don't know exactly what they're called, but I'm gonna be calling them bomb cards. These cards when being pushed into a different card will make that card explode card. So if you want to be a dick, go right ahead. There are also cards that swap where its arrows are, indicated by this little symbol on the bottom left. So Swapping up and down, left and right, or the whole thing. There are a ton of other things this symbol in the bottom left can do too. This little explosion one, after moving a card, will slam down, moving every card around it, like our friend Baz here. This skull card means it can be placed and still be active inside graveyard spaces. There are so many of these, I'll try to go over all of them as I collect them, but sorry if I miss some. And the boss for this area is Mona. Yeah, sorry I'm already moving on to the boss of the house, but literally what else do you want me to say? You play Joustus. Insane. I like her where she'll swap the essence of any cards with another one. She even put one of her own cards into my deck at one point. A lot more strategic than brain damage Black Knight. And after she's defeated, she'll ask if she can hitch a ride with us since where she needs to go is pretty far away. She says she'll owe us one, which is a complete f***ing lie because less than a week later, she puts our essence into tap water soup. Off to the actual levels now. This world having four big themes, Iron Whale, Lost City, Explodatorium, Been There, Done That, and the pre-before stated Truffle Grotto. We already went over the Truffle Pond, but the other gimmicks are really solid. Like the new Lost City mechanic of these dirt mounds. When you drill into them, they'll spit you out the other side. Which is used greatly for the secret exit where you need to be careful exactly where you're jumping so you don't drill directly through into the bubbling brew. You give us this mechanic that we're taught to gain extra height with for this long, then to just take it away and tell us the platform without it. It's so genius. It'd be like if Cuphead randomly had a level where it removed the dash. Or Celeste had a level where it randomly removed the dash. Or Hollow Knight had a section where it randomly removed the dash. You get the point. Another gimmick the Lost City gets are these platforms that move up and down. Yeah, not nearly as cool as the other one. The most new Super Mario Bros. this game feels. The Explodatorium gets these giant ass pipes with corks on them you can slam into, sending the corks flying. Also, this really cool auto-scrolling segment where it starts out as the Explodatorium that then slowly transforms into the Lost City. Love that touch. And the Iron Whale! Well, got a pretty cool mini-boss. Yeah, they barely changed anything with the Iron Whale. I like how they changed the mini-boss, though. It makes it seem like it's the end of the level, and then boom, fish. The only thing I don't like about this world is the shockingly low amount of Trouble Pond stages. The world is mostly dominated by Lost City and Explodatorium areas, and it makes me sad that there are only two Trouble Pond stages. I could look over that if the entire reason we were here wasn't to fight the Trouble King. Alright, I don't have any great ways to segue into the next two things here, so let's talk about the bosses and the heirlooms you can get in the world. First off, the heirlooms, because the ones you get here are some of my favorite in the game. First off, what might be the best item any of the knights can get in the entire game, the Scepter of Swiftness. Why did I deliver it like that? Like, usually when I'm editing, I would just go back and re-record a line I thought I did badly, but what the was that? At the low, low cost of 8 vigor, you can shoot across the stage like a rocket, being able to bypass huge areas. Look at me just casually breaking this entire platforming segment during the explanatorium level I was talking about earlier. Or how about skipping large chunks of that platforming segment during the Lost 
city. On top of that, it does huge damage too, being able to instant kill most enemies. It can even be used on top of water. The only drawback is you have to be on the ground to use it, or on top of water, because why not? He's basically the new Jesus Christ. And if you use it in the air without thinking about it, you'll go straight down. So don't use it like a jackass and you'll be fine. The only thing it struggles with is bosses, but if you need something to deal damage against bosses with, might I suggest the Scorching Saber? It is a sword that is on fire that sends you flying into the air before crashing down, dealing huge damage. It even goes through shields and most things of defense like that. Extra height? Damage dealer? Using way too much vigor? It does it all. Yeah, 14 is a little much, but if you have the vestments of vigor armor, it pretty much pays for itself. And the bosses for the area. So since King of Cards has each area broken up into levels that don't really end with a boss, most of the time the Order of No Quarter guys are kind of just roaming around until King Knight generally interferes with them. Case in point, Mole Knight. He just destroys his hot tub, what an asshole. Or Treasure Knight, how he accidentally gets fished up. Both of them play out exactly like Spectre Knight's versions of them, unfortunately. Except for Plague Knight, funnily enough. You accidentally wander in on him and Percy talking about politics or something, and for the first phase, you actually fight the horse guy. It's a pretty fun fight, too. He uses a bunch of mechanics from Plague of Shadows, like the different bomb casings and stuff. He even uses the big bomb arcana. Then Plague Knight starts, and it's just the Shovel of Hope fight. At least Percy joins in, so it's a bit different. But still, been there, done that. I'm running out of things to talk about, so let's go kill a fish. I forgot there's like a whole stage leading up to the boss, so technically three triple pond stages. Which I guess is a fine amount. Yep, that definitely was a stage I played through. I remember all of it. For no reason related to that, let's talk about the boss. So you get this boat you can move around in using the shoulder bash, and since we're fighting an actual fish, the fight takes place mostly on that raft. It isn't a very hard boss, so most of the difficulty just comes from being on a canoe. It's also just fun that we get to fight the Trouble King at all. His fight is almost entirely just him dancing. Throwing Trouble Fish at you, dashing at you, healing like a bastard. It's a really fun fight. Still pretty easy though, which I get. They didn't want to make the fight where you just or on a raft the whole time, that difficult. And the triple acolyte comes and destroys all continuity this game had. Yep, we're talking about this. So, in the credits of Spectre of Torment, it's shown that the mirror guy went to the trouble pond seeking guidance and was turned into the triple acolyte. And if you couldn't have already guessed by now, King of Cards takes place before Spectre of Torment. Or at least while it was going on. So, how the fuck is the triple acolyte here? This stupid fish guy breaks all continuity this game had. Why, yes, my cock is giant, thank you for noticing. The triple king shares some wisdom with with us about who knows what. Both me and King Knight were pretty tapped out. I was more focused on the giant rift in time and space that was created by this character's presence. Before we move on to World 3, let's talk about what the Trouble King can- Holy shit, we missed an heirloom. Okay, bubble frog thingy. Puts you into a bubble. It's kinda it. Like, it's not bad or anything, but like, what do you want me to say about it? Anyway, the Trouble King. He can give you decrees, which will make random stuff happen when you use one. You have to do whatever the f*** this is first, though. I think I just did the King Knight equivalent of jacking him off. Allergies my ass. Anyway, decrees. You can either have a Griffoth help you deal some damage, a Trouble Fish to restore health and vigor, or summon a Birder to carry you around for a bit. They're all single use, but you can buy more from the Trouble King if you run out. They're useful if you suck at the game. But finally, onto World 3, the Birder Kingdom. I have no idea where else to start, so let's talk about the levels you're immediately presented with. Stranded Ship, Clockwork Tower, and Flying Machine. Business as usual. I'm a pretty big fan of how all of these were changed to add new gimmicks for King Knight. How they add new gimmicks is not by changing anything. Yes, I'm serious. Instead, it's about how King Knight interacts with what's already there. Except for the Flying Machine, because it had to be different. The ice in the Stranded Ship no longer makes you slip, instead makes you slide, which makes for an excellent ride. Also, they made new versions of the Spin Wolves that are annoying as hell. So, of course, they made an entire level centered around those things. The Clockwork Tower has the same corkscrews that Spectre and I had to deal with, but now King Knight can move them by slamming into things. And the flying machine is the flying machine. I guess it has a gimmick of ladders? Yippee? Yes, yes, very cool levels have interesting cool gimmicks. No! This world introduces what is by far the best item any of the knights can get in the entire game. I was wrong. I lied even. The Scepter of Swiftness is good, but not the best. The best relic slash arcana slash curio slash heirloom goes to the gyro boots. You want speed? You got it. You want a double jump? You got it. You want a Mega Man X style wall jump? You got it. You want a pogo you can activate at any time? You got it. You want all of that for only five vigor? The gyro boots do it all and more. No other relic slash arcana slash curio slash heirloom even comes close to these babies. Let's test them out by obliterating Mr. Had. Yeah, so he's here finally enough in the middle of nowhere and he's charging 100,000 gold for everything. We obviously don't buy anything because we physically cannot hold that much money. And he stops us from leaving by holding us with one hand. Mr. Hat is jacked. And he gets pretty pissed and tries to take our hat. Unlike last time, he actually gets a second phase. I'm aware I barely talked about him last time, so Mr. Hat... This is your time, buddy. Mr. Hat is a bit of a silly fella. He has an obsession with... Doorknob. Ha! 
hats. And his boss fight primarily centralizes around him switching head dressings. Yeah, what he considers hats gets stretched a lot. Helmets, berets, kippas, beanies, if you can fit it on your head, it's a hat. And in this case, he's after a crown. And whoever's hat he's wearing, he gains all of their powers. Mr. Hat, under the right circumstances, could beat Goku. So his fight is based off of what I just told you. Switching hats on the fly. One where he has a sword, one where he throws projectiles, a bunch of different stuff. That's where it ends with every other character, but King Knight gets a second phase. At low health, he'll don a crown and pull the sword out of the stone. Now he gets a horse, he can lay out the red carpet, not mentioning this big sword. Still, he's no match for the king. Luckily enough, Kingy is generous enough to let him tag along on the airship, and he even gets to bring his shop with him. He sells a bunch of variety stuff, and it's 10,000 gold each. One that changes your Joustus cards, one that changes your health, and one that makes the airship look like piss. But there's no time for Mr. Hat when there's Joustus to be played. Also, if you're wondering why I talked about the gyro boots and not any of the other heirlooms to this area, that's because I forgot the stupid horns existed. Yeah, I genuinely only realized I forgot these after beating the game. They're literally just that one attack from his boss where he rains down confetti. Who cares? Also, can you blame me for missing these when you have to go back to the first area to get them? Then go back to the first Joustus house. They cost 5,000 gold. Not worth it. So anyway, Joustus house 3. The first guy in this house was stupid hard for no reason. I have no idea why. The rest of the guys in this area were easy peasy, but this guy kicked my ass. I have no clue. This Joustus house introduces two new card gimmicks. The fan and the gears. I don't know if that's their actual name, so that's what I'm calling them. The fan will make any card you push turn the opposite color, which is why Propeller Knight is the most annoying Joustus boss in the entire game. Game, screw him. And if a gear is on one or two of the arrows, it'll make it move automatically. Used primarily by Tinker Knight. The only reason I bring this up is because my attempts to get his card, he kept throwing himself into a pit and then just doing random ass moves that helped neither of us until the game always ended with a draw. This took me 40 minutes. What? Tinker Knight and what? Propeller Knight. Speaking of the knights, you fight all of the usual suspects you'd guess are here. I mean, I guess they technically changed Polar Knight's fight because he gets Spin Wolves now. But the most changed out of all of the fights is Propeller Knight's. In one of the bonus stages that typically just hand a bunch of gold to you for free, you can find his rose in one of the chests. And not too long after that, he'll send a docking party to come attack your airship. The build-up to the fight is a lot of fun, but then it just turns into Spectre Knights after you defeat all of his goons. Alright, so we're getting pretty close to the end of the game now, so I'm gonna assume start rapid firing off random stuff I wanted to say before we go defeat the last Joust's King in on our prize. So you may be thinking, Gazpacho won? You look marvelous today. In the that I would say, oh, I thank you, you look quite lavish yourself. If my mom would come into the room and ask what I'm doing, then I would just say, mom, it's a coping mechanism for having no friends, we've been over this. Then my real mom would walk into the room and ask who I'm talking to, and then I would respond with NOBODY! Gaspacho won? Why haven't you talked about the music for King of Cards yet? And the thing is, I don't really have too much to say about it. Almost every level reused music from Shovel of Hope and Spectre of Torment. I mean, of course, there were unique tracks, like the airship theme, the world map themes, like 50 Joustus themes, but nothing I can truly note on. I mean, I guess the Trouble Pond stage themes are pretty good, but that's just because it remixes the Trouble Dance music. But that's about it. Like, the soundtrack is obviously good, but mostly reused. When it falters in soundtrack, it more makes up for in aesthetics. This game is so goddamn pretty. Look at the background for the Burner Bluff stages, it's absolutely eye candy. Probably my favorite looking campaign out of all of them. Like, look at the backgrounds and you're going back up to the Glide Wing. This one looks like the lesbian flag, it's awesome. And before we move on to the finale, I stated this game has smaller levels instead of big ones like the regular campaigns, but I never gave my feelings on that. Honestly, I'm kind of indifferent about it. I mean, they get to branch out a bunch and try a bunch of different new stuff, including secret exits, the equivalent of star coins, and gimmicks that could support a smaller level, but not an entire 15-minute one. But on the other hand, it means most of these are going to be forgettable. Like, what was the new gimmick of Pride More Castle that was introduced? All of the levels that share themes just kind of blend together in some cases. That doesn't mean it's not fun, it's just kind of like they're throwing so many things at the wall, including old gimmicks and pretty much all of its sticks. But if I started throwing an assortment of random sticky objects at a wall and asked you to remember what was the third thing I threw, you'd probably draw a blank. It's like the distraction news of platformers. I know that was a weird example, but you kind of get what I mean. Also something I completely forgot to talk about, you can get two new shoulder bash upgrades in the second world. One of them gives you a better roll if you time it right, and the other one gives you sparks when you land. Both of these are completely useless. Sorry I'm sick and sleep deprived while I'm writing this, give me some slack. Anyway, time to head on to the final levels and claim our prize. But first, we have to go through one of two unique levels. Okay, I'm sorry, but the three trouble pond stages was adequate, but only two new levels centered around burger bluffs, and they're both at the tail end of the world. That's just stupid, okay? I guess 2.5 since this one part of the flying machine takes place on the ground, but that barely counts, come on. But the burger bluff stages we do actually get are a lot of fun. They introduce these tornadoes that teleport you to different areas, and the ways they use these are pretty cool. I especially like this one secret where you're supposed to go up on the ladder, then fall back down to spin on it, but gyro boots, whoopsie. Now it's time to move on to the final.
up, you son of a bitch. We see Spectre Knight colluding with King Burger, and definitely not the Enchantress before both of them piss off and we fight. I didn't talk about his fight last time, so let's do that now. He gets all of his curios from Spectre of Torment, which I thought was pretty cool. I would break it down farther, but I trapped him in a fiery sword blender underneath a platform, so on phase two, which is just what Shovel Knight had to deal with. Also, them turning out the lights for this was way too overbearing because of the background. I could barely see anything that was happening, I'm pretty sure I won my chance. Okay, let's actually go kill a bird now. His stage has, like, moving blocks, I guess, as a gimmick. I mean, hell, these backgrounds look amazing, but there's no real overarching gimmick in sight. Just kind of a fun level, TBH. We get to the King Burger, and oh no, it turns out he's evil! Yeah, so he gets gyro booted, and shockingly, the Enchantress comes out of nowhere and tells us to go f*** ourselves. So we move on to the final world of the game. Also, sorry I didn't really go into King Burger's fight, but, like, he just kind of parodies the Enchantress's moves. On to the final world, the Tower of Fate. Also, I like the starting area because it's very reminiscent of that one part in Mario 3 where those hands grab you. IDK, it looks cool. I don't know if that was similar on purpose, but it would be funny if it was. Third time's the charm. Enchantress Stage 1 reuses its gimmicks from the first world of the game. How unique. I will give them this, though. It was fun to go fast as f*** through here with the gyro boots. And something I forgot to bring up during that segment where I was raffling off stuff that King of Cards is great at, it is phenomenal when it comes to unique enemies. Sure, a lot of them are just variants, like the sumo gold armors, exploding versions of those fairies introduced in the Enchantress stages, and those shield guys from the Lost City, except for this time they have burners attached to the ropes. Enemy variety is probably its biggest strengths. It just introduced so many new guys, I love it. Saving the world can wait, I found a secret exit that led to more joust as f Yeah. This house primarily focuses on the guys from Spectre Knight's campaign. So the Wisp Lady, Red, the Liquid Samurai enemy for some reason, and the Rat Bastard from the Trial Tower. For the final time, let's talk about new joust gimmicks. My, my script said skimmicks instead of gimmicks, so I'm saying it. And unless I'm forgetting something, there is only one. Weaker cards typically have one arrow of pushing force, and the majority of other ones have two arrows. Well, this area introduces three arrows of force, but they only last three turns. And unless I'm missing something, that's literally it. Horus, who is the final boss of the house, is a pretty fun gimmick, though, mimicking his Spectre of Torment appearance. Throughout the entire game, you'll have a limited amount of time to place a card, and if its electricity thing reaches its maximum, you'll lose a turn. Cool way of adding that gimmick to a card game. Anyway, back to the actual objective, Enchantress Stage 2. It's more gimmicks being brought back, how shocking, but Enchantress Stage 3 is pretty cool. They have this green goop that will cycle you to different parts of the screen depending on what part of it you're at. So if there's some on the floor and ceiling, you can warp between them. Same with the left and right walls. What a cool gimmick, I'm glad they use it for exactly one level. So finally, on to defeating the Enchantress for the last time. So specifically for her fight and the build up to her fight, they introduce this new block. When you jump off of it or shoulder bash onto it, it breaks. So basically Spectre Knight mode. We meet her in her throne room from the credits of Spectre of Torment, and every character who's notorious for not being able to fight well immediately rushes in with us to greet the second most powerful person in the entire land. They screw off and let us fight each other. And it's literally just a Spectre of Torment version of the fight, except for those purple blocks from a minute ago. Yeah, not a lot to say, so we bust her up and she sees how cool and awesome we are. And throughout the entire thing, King Knight has not been saying a damn word. Stop ellipsing, damn it! So she grabs Pride More, the Trouble King Acolyte, and the Burger King, takes their essence and turns them into this giant abomination. And might I just say, this is the most annoying final boss out of all of the campaigns. So it has these gems on the side of its face you need to shoulder bash or roll into. And one of the biggest problems I have with this fight is that you can only deal damage using that. You can use your heirlooms, but all of them just do half a point of damage like everything else. You know what, actually, remember the Sigma boss from Mega Man X? It's that. It's literally just that. You need to get up on its hands while it's attacking you so you can attack its face, but you can only use one type of attack that's really effective. It's literally just Sigma. It's such an annoying fight in its second phase, if you aren't ready, it's so much worse. So it breaks the floor when it has 2 HP left, and if you fall down during that, tough shit because you have to restart everything. Then its second phase, for starters, just looks <laughs> horrifying, but also continues off of the floor being gone. It has a lot less health, but if you fall, you have to restart the entire boss from phase 1. You know what, let's rank all of the final bosses for every campaign. Shovel of Hope at number one because it showed off the great dynamic between Shield Knight and Shovel Knight working together, plus it was fun. Spectre of Torment at number two because it looked awesome. Plague of Shadows at number three, nothing against it, just the others are better. And King of Cards at dead last because it's just completely unfair. So the big guy has been defeated and our friends have been freed. The Enchantress says some shababble about how cool we are and that we should totally join her cool new gang. Yo dude, the Order of No Quarter is pretty chill, maybe you could like join it or something. As the Enchantress is trying to coax us, Pride More butts in telling him to pull them up, and in a very nice shot similarity, they're all dangling from a chain about to fall, just like the Order of No Quarter was back from the boss rush. I'm going to quickly interject to talk about something mostly unrelated. Every campaign up to this point has had one major theme, and that's sacrifice. Shield Knight sacrifices herself so Black Knight and Shovel Knight could leave in one piece. Plague Knight sacrificed everything he had worked for just so he could be with Mona. Spectre Knight sacrificed his life so Reese could have his. And King Knight? 
He sacrificed everybody he had become friends with, all so he could finally get what he's been after this whole time. He never cared about his friends, he never cared about Geostis. All he wanted to do was become king. And well, he got it. King Knight is not a hero. I mean like obviously, but Plague Knight and Spectre Knight were also part of the order, but more morally grey. Except for Plague Knight, he just kind of enjoys killing people. I've been drawing parallels to Spectre of Torment this entire review of King of Cards, so allow me to do it one last time. The ending of Spectre of Torment was Spectre Knight giving up everything he had just to keep his promise to Luan. The ending of King of Cards is King Knight betraying everybody he had earned the trust of in the pursuit of glory. The glide wing gets destroyed, with Mr. Hat's shop falling off, the bard's music sheets getting scattered everywhere, the Trouble King going into hiding. By all accounts, this is not a happy ending, and not in the way of Spectre of Torment where it was bittersweet. King Knight is a horrible, greedy, self-centered, f***able, lazy tyrant. His first decree as king is to destroy all Joustus cards. Also, could you imagine like a new president getting elected and his first initiative is destroy all esports venues? This final credit scene kind of just sums up exactly what I'm saying. Both his mom and Pride more leave him into his throne room. He has everything he wanted, but he's alone. And if you are upset by this ending, the final after credits shows Shovel Knight coming to beat the shit out of him, so all's well ends well. And that's King of Cards. Upon replaying it, is it still my favorite campaign? Yes and no. You could even say it's lazy with the amount of stuff it takes for Spectre of Torment, reused bosses, music, level gimmicks. But I think of it differently. I view King of Cards as a best of, or look how far we've come for the Shovel Knight franchise. I mean, you're literally playing as the first boss of the game. And looking at it that way, I can kind of excuse a lot of things it borrows from the other campaigns. And that's not to say it doesn't have its own unique elements, Joustis, how he controlled, and what I think is this game's biggest strength, and what makes it my favorite campaign, is its charm. This is one of the most charming and funny platformers I've ever played. King Knight's exchanges with everybody, how much of an asshole he is all the time, just kind of loops back to being endearing. The start to every boss stage, how he finds different ways to break in every time, him sometimes falling on his face when you enter a stage. There is a lady on your ship from the start of the game that demands you beat every Joustus judge and when you finally do, she creates a pocket dimension with a black hole in the background and demands you play Joustus with her on her magical table she just created, in which she'll use every gimmick and boss power up to that point, and when you beat her and refuse to be her planet's savior, she turns into Mega Cardia and this is genuinely one of the hardest fights in the game. WHAT?! If you go back to the crater where Mr. Hat's shop was and go all the way to the left of the horse that speaks and rhymes and just kills you if you accept whatever he wanted, there is this one ghost that wants to tell you his life story but King Knight cuts him off and says he doesn't have time for it and just dips out of reality. This is why I love King of Cards. All of these other campaigns are so serious with their moods and then this goofy ass King of Cards over here sending you to a fairy garden with Madame Meeber that was originally supposed to be for a scrapped moon level. Now, with all of that being said, I do have complaints. The heirlooms you have access to are some of the funnest in the game, but I really only cycle between like three of them. Gyro Boots, Flaming Sword, and sometimes the Scepter of Swiftness. That's really about it. The reuse of bosses do kind of feel annoying after a while, except for the ones that change things up either in a funny way or a gameplay way like Mole Knights or Propeller Knights. I would have really, really enjoyed if they used more new themes they came up with instead of just relying on old ones. But even then, I have counters for those points. Instead of revamping bosses that just got revamped in the last campaign, they decided to do it on random bosses like Mr. Hat and Baz, along with creating new cool bosses like the Truffle King. Yes, new themes for the stages would have been cool, but there's like 40 Joustus tracks. My complaints aren't nearly as long as my compliments. He controls like butter, it's very funny, the Joustus is a lot of fun, the new bosses are really good, as well as the new gimmicks, the gyro boots. But if I had to say objectively what is the best campaign, it'd probably be Spectre of Torment. Objectively, I think the list for the best campaign are Plague of Shadows, King of Cards, Shovel of Hope, then Spectre of Torment. But if it was up to me, I would probably say it goes Plague of Shadows, Shovel of Hope, Spectre of Torment, then King of Cards. But who am I to say what is the best one? I know some people who think Plague of Shadows is the best one, and that's perfectly okay. Or Shovel of Hope, or Spectre of Torment, and I'm alone with my stupid f***ing opinions of liking King of Cards. There is truly no good answer to what is the best campaign, and honestly, I think that's one of Shovel Knight Treasure Trove's best qualities. ALL OF THEM ARE GOOD! I'm honestly surprised Shovel Knight Treasure Trove isn't brought up more in those Desert Island gaming questions. You get four really good platformers, and if you have friends, you get a party. We can stop the sentence there, it's okay. Okay, here we go. So Yacht Club couldn't just stop with four amazing campaigns. When they made the Kickstarter for this game, the amount of stretch goals that was hit was insane. And one of those stretch goals was a multiplayer fighting game. And by a technicality, they delivered Shovel Knight Showdown!
is mediocre. So Shovel Knight Showdown is a platform fighting game like Smash Brothers or Nick All Stars Brawl 2. It has a story mode, so I'll just talk about that and let my thoughts unravel while I talk about it. So this actually takes place during the events of Spectre of Torment, specifically right after Spectre Knight stormed off to kill the Enchantress. All of Spectre Knight's friends decide to double cross the Enchantress as well by re-engineering the mirror to hopefully trap her in it or something. But they screw it up and accidentally shatter the thing, creating a bunch of fake versions of various characters. And whatever night you play as gets caught in the middle of it. You know the campaign mode for most Smash Brothers games up to Wii U? You have to fight a bunch of different characters with different conditions like collecting gems or taking all of their stocks. Of course there's a bunch of stuff on top of that like fighting multiple enemy teams, a character chosen rival, a bunch of different shenanigans. How you fight opponents is by fighting opponents. Alright, I've been trying to work up to it. To explain why I don't like Showdown, allow me to show you the move list for King Knight. But before I do, how would you put King Knight into a platform fighting game? Let's just say specifically putting him into Smash Brothers. Obviously his shoulder bash would be his side special, maybe the flaming sword as its recovery, the charge downwards variant of the shoulder bash for his down air. Hell, somebody put him in Rivals of Aether from way earlier. With all of that in mind, let me show you how Shovel Knight Showdown made him. He has three moves! Shoulder bash, throwing the rat bomb, and parrying. That's it. The problem I have with Showdown is it leans way too much into the party aspect instead of being a good fighting game on its own. Now, that wouldn't be a problem if it was actually fun to play. It feels clunky and unresponsive most of the time. No ways to mix up your movement or even combo people. It's a fighting game with horrible fighting mechanics. I couldn't even see this being fun as a party game. Actually, who is this game's demographic? It's a local multiplayer exclusive party fighting game inside of your entirely single player narrative driven platformer. To set this game up and for everybody to have a good time, you would need more than one person in the same room that are both Shovel Knight fans, both wanting to play this game over anything else, and both having never played any other platform fighting game. Oh yeah, the plot. You go to the big mirror, it's evil, you smash it, game over. Okay, I've been pretty negative, but I do have positives. The fact every Shovel Knight boss character is playable is really cool. Probably was a hell of a lot of work to do that. The stages are actually really fun. I especially liked this one flying machine level where you go through the glide wing. That was really cool. Also, screw this one lost city stage for ignoring my pixel perfect settings. This will not be forgotten. I'm keeping this brief on purpose because I don't know what you want me to say besides I do not like it, it is very bare bones, and I question why it even exists. Honestly, what I want is a Shovel Knight Showdown sequel that gives every character a fleshed out moveset, like a traditional platform fighter. That would be awesome, but as it stands, this is wholly unnecessary, and it prevents me from saying that Jakob has made no bad video games yet, the nerve. No bad video games yet, keep that in mind. Honestly, I could be a lot more harsh, because Yacht and Cobes considers this its own game you can buy separately for $10 if you want to. But to me, this is just a side note. Past that, we have a challenge mode for every character, and dear god, there are over 25 for these per character. Yeah, I'm not doing all these. Especially considering some of these are really difficult. Cool if you want to add an extra 5 hours onto your playtime. But I think I'm going to end my discussion of Shovel Knight Treasure Trove here. But really, I could go for like another 20 minutes. I mentioned challenge mode incredibly briefly a minute ago, but it's a lot of fun if you have nothing better to do. There is a New Game Plus for all of the knights, doing a variety of things, such as combining Spectre Knight's health and darkness into one meter. There is a body swap mode that can change the gender of every character, or just remove it entirely, including new sprites made for all of your options. And that's not even bringing up the dozens of cheat codes you can use. One that makes every instance of the word shovel and knight to butt because XD lol. One that makes every enemy bigger. One that makes shovel knight bigger. One that changes your palette for every jump, hit, and screen change. One that makes the game almost completely unplayable. One that makes you invisible. Arby's again. A ton of random junk. But the ones I want to focus on are the ones that alter gameplay slightly. Shovel Knight can poke off of anything like Scourge McDuck. Plague Knight gets a weirdly high frame rate walk cycle. Spectre Knight gets a wall cling, which I guarantee you I'm missing with the references. And King Knight can do a spin dash, because why not? I could honestly make an entire video just going over all of these, but alas, there is more to talk about. If you want to sort through all 300 of them, there's some fun to be had. But that is it. That is the entirety of Shovel Knight Treasure Trove. All of Treasure Trove was finished back in December of 2019, and just two years later, they would come out with a new game. Not new content for the pre-existing Treasure Trove, a completely new game in the Shovel Knight franchise. Shovel Knight Pocket Dungeon. So this video was originally just supposed to be a review of Shovel Knight Treasure Trove, and then I would quickly do overviews of Shovel Knight Pocket Dungeon and Shovel Knight Dig. Because I'm gonna be honest, I took one look at Shovel Knight Pocket Dungeon and immediately determined it would not be fun. So then I was on a family road trip, and I was on my Steam Deck, and I decided to try out the game because I had nothing 
nothing better to do, and in the first 10 minutes it asked me if I wanted to spend the game in puzzle mode or roguelite mode. 30 hours later! Okay, so I got a little addicted to this game, but it's their fault for making the game too good. So, f*** it, I'm doing a review of this game too, and dig as well. This might go on for another hour, but I'm already too far into this, so let's go. Alright, I'm kind of really far into this game, and I didn't want to buy it again on a different platform, so bye-bye, I'll save data. So Shovel Knight is minding his own business, sleeping, when suddenly a box appears out of nowhere and is containing another box. Classic trick, so he opens it and surprise, surprise, it sucks him into a pocket dimension. Specifically, the pocket dungeon. When he is then rescued from getting attacked by Chester, who is here for some reason, and new character, Puzzle Knight. The rambling about how this place is unsolvable or something until wham, blocks. This is where our tutorial starts and things making sense ends. This game lets you replay the tutorial but not rewatch the opening cutscene, sure, whatever. It's here, through smashing blocks and fighting a random array of enemies, you have literally two options at your display. Moving and hitting X to do a special thing if your character has it. Moving not only lets you walk, but also lets you attack things by bumping into them. You just have to shove into them by hitting the direction on the d-pad they're in. Each enemy has a different amount of health and attack. Specifically, Shovel Knight and almost every other character you'll find has five health and one attack. Every time you bump into an enemy, you both attack each other, but if they're at the amount of health where you can kill them in one hit, you won't take any damage. So let's say you're fighting an enemy that has three health and two attack, and you have five health and one attack. The first bump will bring you down to three health and it down to two, then you both down to one health, and the final bump will kill it, but you'll be fine. Now since you're at such a low health, after that you'll probably want to heal. Luckily there are health potions and occasionally turkeys all over the place. After you heal, you can repeat the whole thing. That's a very basic explanation of the combat system, but adding on to that, that is the chains. You know how if you get a bunch of poyos of the same color touching each other when four of them start to go off, they'll all explode? It's like that, but in Shovel Knight form. All like enemies that are touching each other will take the same amount of damage as the first one does. It's a lot easier to explain looking at it than saying it, but enemy that touch other enemy die with enemy. Basic sounding, I know, but in practice it's actually a lot of fun. It's basically any match three game, but your character, in most non-game breaking cases, can't move the enemies, instead relying on them to fall down into the perfect position for you to line them up. Going back to an example I already made, it's like Puyo Puyo mixed with WarioWare Get It Together. Your traditional puzzle game, but hey look, here's Plague Knight in the middle of the screen for some reason. Moving on from that, you finish up that gang of Beatos and Puzzle Knight plus Chester take you back to their base. This will be your hub of operations for the entire game. And outside of some cool things you can find, it's basically a character select screen. And if you're wondering why it looks so empty, which I know you weren't, but it makes more sense flow-wise for the video if I say you were, that's because there are no characters to select yet. It's just the SK. Puzzle Knight tells you to follow him and gives you the option between between playing this in puzzle mode or roguelite mode. Yeah, you already know we're going with roguelite time, baby! So the general gameplay loop revolves around hitting enemies, gathering health potions after you take damage from the enemies, hit more enemies, it's a lot funner than I make it sound, I promise. How they mix up this formula are the relics and items you can find. Keys will periodically drop, and keys can unlock chests. Those chests contain temporary items you can use, such as a sword that can give you a higher attack, a shield that will block one point of damage, like two other swords that do procedurally more damage, a laser beam that can do 5 damage but only in a straight line, a smoke bomb that shields you from Damage. The Kronos coin, which can stop time, and my personal favorite is the wild card, which can cause mass genocide of a single enemy type. Speaking of enemy types, how each room mixes things up and keeps it fresh is by typically introducing new enemies. Level 1, the planes just has what you would expect from that level of the first game. Slimes, Beatos, Skeleton Dudes, the works. Bone Clangs have 2 attack and 3 HP, so by far the most dangerous out of all of them. Blorbs, or whatever they were called, don't actually damage you back, but instead can leave a puddle of poison which can damage you. And Beatos are Beatos, they can't do much. That's pretty much all that's going on in the first level, but considering you can clear in like a minute and 30 seconds, it's not supposed to be crazy. Just introductions, mostly. But moving on to Pridemore Castle, which is our second level, things get a bit more interesting. Gold armors only have one attack and four HP, but after you hit them once, they'll put up a shield in the way you attacked them. You can brute force your way through, but it'll cost you a lot more turns to do so. Alternatively, you can just go around them to a different side and hit them that way. Or if you have the spear item you can also get from chests, you can go through it and probably hit somebody behind them as well. Now, regular enemies aren't the only thing that can fall. Obviously potions, but also blocks that were from the first level. But specifically on Pridemore Castle and a level way later on, mini bosses can spawn. It's just the Griffoth and it's really not that hard, but cool that it's here. But those blocks that I mentioned can do other things than just be in your way. They can also contain portals to secret rooms. Usually just a room full of enemies you'll have to clear out, and if you defeat all of them, you get 500 gems. Which is also the reward you get if you clear out the regular room before leaving. It can be a bunch of other junk too, maybe it's a room full of weapons that you 
you have to choose from that sometimes contains an ambush. Maybe it's a room with a guy giving out useless f***ing cards. But starting at level 3, the Lich Yard, there's something else you can find in these as well. This is one of four shrines you can find in a run, and they all require a sacrifice of some kind, like three keys for the first one or one HP for the second one. I'll go over more of them as we go on, but if you have the price the door is asking for, you can move on in and get some pretty sweet rewards. Specifically for the first one, you can find Shield Knight. I don't know why she isn't happier seeing Shovel Knight, but whatever. And you also get one shard of whatever it was called key. What this key does, I will unveil later, but now let's move on to the Lich Yard itself. Probably my least favorite level already. These ghosts, after you hit them once, cannot be hit again until you do something else. Staying in this Eternal form. And the only other new enemy here to hit is the Zap Toads, that on certain turns can electrify you. Also, the Bone Clangs are back. All of those things just make this level really hard for this early on in the game, which isn't really helped by the fact that immediately after this, there's a boss against a random knight. This first fight can only be one of a few of them. King Knight, Plague Knight, Spectre Knight, and new character- Not Scrap Knight, I was wrong, she's later. King Knight has the ability of dashing around like in his game counterpart, but it's King Knight, so it's not that hard. Spectre Knight is a hard fight, though, because of how his stupid, dumb, dumb, idiot bitch scythe works. This stupid thing is always an active hitbox and it's ginormous, but like King Knight, he goes down pretty easy. Plague Knight just focuses on throwing around rats at you. It's not very interesting moving on. After defeating a knight, though, they will join your team and you can play as them. We'll go over all of them later, but for now, on to level 4, the Magic Junkyard, or whatever it was called, I'm not looking it up. This, and along with two other locations, are based off of new characters introduced. So we have new enemies to fight, exclusive to this game. Purple, taller versions of the slimes that are all honestly just reskin beatos, but they do like one more damage. And Wisms, whichever one you're attacking will jump out of the way when it's at 1 HP. And aside from that, there's also Rat Sploders, been there, done that. Unlike the regular bombs, which have a radius of 2 on all sides, and will explode after a few turns, Rat Sploders explode after only 2 turns and have a radius of 1. Since there's not a lot to talk about in the Magic Junkyard, let's talk about Chester and his shop. So gems can be just gotten from defeating enemies, but the more enemies you defeat and the faster you do it, the bigger this gem meter at the bottom of the screen will get. One times, two times, three times, and capping out at four times. And those gems can be given to Chester in exchange for relics. I won't be going over all of them because what kind of idiot would go over all of the things in a video game that there are tons of, specifically at the end of the video, causing it to be half an hour longer- Please watch my gun new video. And while I have your attention, if you're at this point, you've clearly enjoyed the video, so I would appreciate if you subscribed, especially considering I have something special Shovel Knight related cooking up. Hey, editing me, remove that line if you screw up making the entire project, thanks. <laughs> oh, scripting me had no idea. I'll put an image on screen of the work in progress at the time of me editing this, but it's not becoming a video. Anyway, now that I'm done selling you on stuff, let's go back to this guy selling you on stuff. Chester sells you permanent items you can use for the rest of your run. They can do a ton of different things, like increasing attack, giving you more health, and a bunch of other nonsense like that. The one that gives you more health is especially useful coming up into the level 5 of the Iron Whale, where you can find another shrine this time, requiring one health. Also, unlike last time, it doesn't give you a random choice between two relics, it just gives you a bunch of money. Useful, but not as useful. All of the enemies you would expect from the Iron Whale are here. Those snails from the first game that bounce all around have a similar mechanic where they get pushed if nobody's behind them. Those jellyfish, if they connect to another jellyfish, will stay together and start floating. So it's often that a bunch of them just hoard at the top of the screen, jamming everything. And those tentacle creatures. You can hit them from their head, if they start coming down, they'll block a huge part of the screen. Their bodies are invulnerable, so good luck if it reaches the bottom. Aside from that, not too much going on here, so on to the level 6, Crystal Caverns which is probably the hardest level out of all of them. Mainly because of two new enemies, the Swarm Bees that are pretty puny by themselves, but with every other Swarm Bee they link up with, they'll gain one attack power, maxing out at three. And the stupid, dumb, idiot, fucking stupid, dumb, dumb, bane of my existence, burning in hell, bitch, idiot, crabs! The Crystal Crabs are my least favorite enemy and not even warranting me looking up their name. They have 10 HP, which is already outlandish, but they're also the only enemy that can move horizontally, meaning they're all just going to group up at the bottom. If you get surrounded by literally any other enemy in the game, and you have 5 HP, you'll more than likely be okay. But even if you've bought both of the meal tickets and gotten your HP up to 10, and you happen to not be at full health when you get surrounded by these guys, tough shit runs over. I don't know who thought these were a good idea, but I want to wish them a nice day, because they're probably a great person in real life. What's worse is you have to fight a boss at the end of the level, which is just wonderful if you ended up at low HP because of the stupid crabs. This time around, we have Mole Knight, Treasure Knight, and Tinker Knight for some reason. And also Scrap Knight. Mole Knight is a fine enough boss, like his boss battle from Shovel Knight Treasure Trove for the Nintendo Switch, PS4, PS3, Xbox One, Wii U, 3DS, PlayStation Vita, and PC and Mac. He'll go into the ground and walls that emerge to attack you. When he does, he'll get lava all over the place, as well as this magma sputer that needs to be dealt with immediately or it'll just make a 
huge mess. Treasure Knight is honestly just kind of annoying. He puts water everywhere, which will get you stuck in there for one turn. His boss fight is just kind of a slog. New character, Scrap Knight, who has walls that close in on you and buzz saws that go across the ground. Loosely connected theme, but sure. And Tinker Knight, who is by far the coolest one. His first phase goes exactly how you would expect it to go, just throwing wrenches everywhere and running away. After you sock him enough times, he'll pull out his robot where his fight really starts. Giant punches that destroy anything in their wake, buzz saws that go everywhere, it's a really good boss, which is an achievement because of reasons I'll talk about later. After defeating one of those goons, we can move on to the next level I lost track of what number we're on, the Clockwork Tower. Which, the Clockwork Tower is as hard as the Crystal Cave, but a lot funnier. Alright, enemy roundup time. Blue Beetos that are just as regular Beetos, but have double the HP. Electric Rat things, I don't know the name of. Yeah, I actually do know the name now, because I got all the cards in King of Cards because I was bored. They're Electrodents. <laughs> They'll become electrified after you hit them. Very annoying, I guarantee. And Fairies, who will randomly start going berserk. I have no idea what the conditions for these are, they just start freaking out. There is literally no way of telling what could possibly be the conditions for them starting this. Something the Clockwork Tower does that no other stage can do is environmental hazards. Sometimes when you enter a stage, there will be tracks that move enemies along automatically. It's small, but it's enough to mess up your lines. Nothing too much going on here aside from that though, onto the Stranded Ship, which is a lot funnier than the last two. Mainly because you can rack up insane chains off the Spin Wolf population. They just spam these guys everywhere, it's insane. They just never stop with these guys, I swear. I mean, they're not difficult, but still. Also new here are the ice slimes that leave a puddle of frost on the ground. Predictably, they light you on fire, so not a lot to talk about with those. Remember those guys with the shields from the stranded ship? Yeah, they're here, not exactly the most fun thing to fight against. They're like the gold armors in the way they'll raise their shields, but instead they'll charge the way they're facing every time you attack. Just annoying, honestly, don't like these guys. Also, there's a mini boss here for no reason, despite the fact almost every level except the stranded ship had a mini boss. So, why not? It's a big yeti dude who can freeze enemies that are within one block around it. It'll just throw them everywhere, pretty whatever, honestly. What isn't whatever, honestly, is the third shard located here, requiring 20,000 gems to be given up. Not only do you find the shard, but you also find our favorite private eye, Black Knight. He promises he's going to get to the bottom of this, but doesn't actually know what the shard is for, so he says we should take it and buzzes off. What a nice young lad. On to our final level that isn't unique to this game, the flying machine. And if you want to be technical about it, this is made up of entirely reused enemies. The jellies from the iron whale, the wisdoms from the magic junkyard, and even technically the propeller rats are also in King Knight's fight. I didn't talk about them though, so propeller rats. They'll fly up to the top of the screen before falling back down and continuously doing that until they die. Not a bad way to spend your life. But before we move on to the final level, we have to go through one more boss fight. Polar Knight Polars, Propeller Knight Propellers. Yeah, very cool. New character though. Sorry I don't have too much to say about the bosses, but I'm not going to blame my script writing on that. Instead, I'm going to blame the game. The bosses aren't that good in this game, I'll say it. Attacking, then running away like a sissy baby works for regular levels since it's supposed to be a puzzle. Nothing really climactic is happening, but during a boss, it feels cheap. Like in Dark Souls, when you go in for a quick strike, then immediately run to the other side of the arena to heal. Like, they do all work. I wouldn't say any of them aren't fun, but none of them are particularly good neither. Like, Plague Knight's boss was literally just him throwing potions everywhere and running away. Now that I've finished talking about how much I hate the bosses and that the people who made this game deserve to die, let's talk about a boss. Prism Knight primarily focuses around creating clones, beams of energy, and teleportation, all of which are incorporated into the boss. She'll create clones, which are all one shot, but after she's created two, she'll fire a big beam attack, where the others will join in. And then the final ray from the heavens you need to attack her to stop. That's really it, but it's all it needed to be. Actually, fun boss. It felt like a puzzle this time, wow. The only bosses that really felt like they're supposed to be in a puzzle game are like Tinker Knight, Maybe Scrap Knight? I don't know. So finally, off to the final level of the game, the final Skuller Sanctum final. I know it feels like we got here fast, but it's a roguelite with this main draw being replayability. What do you expect? And unfortunately, this level kind of blows. All of the enemies are reused, which I can kind of get what they were going for. It's all of the hardest ones up to this point, so in a way, it's like the Enchantress's stages from the first game. But I don't care, this is lame. But we can also get our final shard around here. I don't remember if it was from Propeller Knights or this one, so I'm just saying it's this one. We see Prism Knight talking to this cloaked figure I definitely do not recognize. Okay, actually, fuck you, I'm not doing this bitch. She used the same disguise twice. That is the Enchantress. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, there's a case to be made that Shovel Knight can beat Goku. Some junk about how that mysterious figure I definitely don't recognize has tasked Prism Knight with putting this pocket dungeon cube all over the land since she can teleport in and out of it freely throughout the pocket dungeon and the real world. That's great, just bring up on an offhand remark that your new character can travel between dimensions. Why not? I'm not going to pretend like Shovel Knight characters aren't already busted off the wazoo, but we butt in and take our final shard and march off to the final boss. Who is Puzzle? 
Hollow Knight, surprisingly. Apparently, he's been here for years, not being able to unravel the mysteries of the Pocket Dungeon. But if he can defeat us, we'll become the new Dungeon Masters, and he'll go free. So it's boss time, and he's actually a pretty good one. He has a compass he'll swing at you, a shield he'll put up that needs to be destroyed, like a bajillion HP. He's got it all. But yeah, of course, he's no match for the power of the shovel. We've successfully thwarted his plans, and right before the portal opens, sending us out of the Pocket Dungeon for good, Prism Knight bursts in using that cool key we found to open the lock for everybody. But it turns out, oh, Fiddlesticks is a final, final level. The Tower of Fate. What a twist! Dude, I'm gonna be honest, I do not remember a single enemy from this level besides the fact there are like five Grithoths. That's because it has no traditional enemies, only like fire slimes and rat sploders, and versions of those tentacle enemies that have more health. Kind of disappointing as a final level, but if I'm being honest, even more disappointing than the Skull or Sanctum. I'm not even saying these are bad or anything, I'm just saying they could have been better. God, I fucking hate indie developers. On to the true final boss, which is shockingly the Enchantress, who saw this turn of events. Okay, like, I get that Yacht Club wanted to have their own version of Bowser or, or Ganondorf or Neo Cortex, a final boss that comes back repeatedly that they have to thwart the plots of, but is there any good reason why she's actually here? We can fight her a shovel line, we shattered the amulet, what are you doing? Turns out the Enchantress promised Prism Knight she'd help her find her dad if she learned it a bunch of knights and it's box they're in. But uh-oh, double cross. Since everybody was in here and that she was out there and that we're the sheriff and that she's frozen out there and that we're in there, she can do anything she wants while we're trapped in here. And what I mean by do whatever she wants, I mean literally do nothing with his head start. So we battle her and it's a pretty fun fight. Big balls of energy, lasers, even this cool fireball attack that needs to be dodged interspersingly. It's a really fun fight, surprisingly. I died. Yeah, okay, it's hard, and since it's a roguelite, we're back at the base camp. So since we're here, let's go over everything you can do before heading back to our true ending and leaving the pocket dungeon. By the way, before I go off on this huge tangent, if you didn't collect the four key fragments, you would just leave the pocket dungeon by yourself, leaving everybody behind. Anyway, the hub is more than just a character select. There's a ton of junk you can do here. Randomly inside one of these bonus rooms, you can find the hedge farmer. He needs you to clean out this room full of beetos, but after you do so, he'll set up camp in the hub. He can't really do much for us right now, so we'll come back to him. You can buy new relics and runs from Chester, nothing really else to say about that. You can also find a hidden room right next to his shop where Mona and her little game is. It's just a reaction test, nothing really that special. It took us less than a minute, but we've already exhausted every cool thing you can do here. Back to our friend the hedge farmer then, and this guy has an issue. He needs to get this bean into the ground, but no regular attacks can move it. This is a weird comparison, but you ever play Skylanders? You know that one tower in the overworld, the first game that requires swapping between different Skylanders to solve? It's literally just that. You have to switch to Mold Knight to move the seed, then a Fleeto comes in, which you have to use Plague Knight to get off, and then finally a character with a shovel to bury it. Now, what do you get for all of that? You get access to the Castle Quandary. I haven't gone over all of the playable characters yet because I've been waiting for this. It's here you can buy new hats that change how the game works for Mr. Hat. Yeah, that's great, who cares, but also access to the Quandary challenges. At least that's what I think they're called. Get on with it! These four portals, based on what character you're playing, will change what they do. The top ones never change, and I'll be going over them in a little bit, but the ones to the left and right change based off the character. The left one having specific gimmicks based off said character, like Mole Knight's burying everything, and the one to the far right gives every character a new ability. Black Knight gets his Meteor, Shield Knight can throw her shield, Spectre Knight can do this little dash with his scythe, you get the deal. So this feels like a great time to finally go over every character in the game, starting off with Shovel Knight. As you could predict, he's pretty basic, his only real gimmick being extra damage to chains. He's a pretty blank slate. His Quandary ability though gives him the Shovel Pogo. After you kill one enemy with it, it'll double its damage until the pogo finishes. Great for absolutely styling on your foes. He's pretty simple, but onto our next character, King Knight, and pretty much every other character going forward will all have a specific quirk that makes them special. For example, King Knight gets his shoulder bash from King of Cards. You'll take double damage if you do it, but depending on how far away you are from your opponent, they'll also take more damage. So you can pretty much one-shot most things if you have the spacing. It's way too easy to knock yourself out using this, honestly. And his quandary ability is his cards. Any chain of three or more enemies you defeat, or a boss, will allow him to use that enemy's card, and they function exactly like they did in King of Cards, even having the exact arrows from that game. The amount of effort just for this one character's ability is crazy. Neither of these are too useful, though. I'm going to start ranking things now, because if I can't classify things, my autistic brain will malfunction. So I would put King Knight in D tier. Also, Shovel Knight goes in C because he's pretty middle of the road. Stepping back from King Knight now, we have Spectre Knight. His main gimmick is if he eats a potion, he'll lose 1 HP and gain health every enemy he defeats. The bigger the chain, the more health you get back. It's honestly not that great, especially considering 
considering you can die in a single hit if you're surrounded by too many potions. Now his Quandary ability is a lot better. He can Scythe Slash through enemies as so long as there's space behind them. Now he will take damage proportionate to the amount of enemies you go through, so be wary of that, but still, it's a really good ability. Great if you're cornered at the bottom of the screen or something. Also great for chains, since every enemy in the row takes damage. The Quandary is really carrying him on this one B tier. If you couldn't switch between the regular and Quandary abilities after you beat their campaign, he would be a lot lower. And finally, finishing off the Quadrilogy, we have Plague Knight. Plague Knight starts off every run with the Toad Totem item, and basically everything he touches becomes poisoned. He's also immune to poison, so to compensate for all of that, he starts with one less HP than everybody else. All it takes is one good meal ticket, and that one weakness is completely nullified. Really good, honestly. Also, I love his Quandary Challenge, where his poison persists for longer, but everything has more health, so his entire gameplay is just this. You have three days left to live. But his Quandary is the Burst Jump, also from his campaign. If you collect a potion at max HP, it'll charge your Burst. You can also use your regular Burst as much as you want, but if it's charged, it has an explosive tied to it, which deals two damage, so not useless. A pretty good get out of jail free card, especially good for those bosses since their areas are typically more open and won't block the jump. Overall, Plague Knight gets a solid A tier. And starting off the new additions, we have Scrap Knight. She can throw things in her bag that are around her and then save them for later. Saving potions, moving something so it'll have a bigger chain, any application you can think of that can come from that stuff is probably applicable. A really solid gimmick, but it's not that versatile. And our Quandary ability is the Bag Toss. Throw it and you can switch places with whatever is within that 9 tile space over there. It's hard to explain it through words, so just look at it. It requires way too much planning to use, though. Considering most of this game is on the fly thinking, I can't see this being very useful. Overall, Scrap Knight gets a C tier. Treasure Knight is probably the knight I'm most mixed on, so his ability, if he's attacking from below, he'll deal double damage, which is like the most whatever ability in the entire game. It's like they panicked and just threw this in here at the last second. But luckily, his Quandary represents his character a lot better. His Grapple Anchor can pull enemies and pretty much anything as long as it's in a line, even grappling yourself to different parts of the area if there's nobody there. Most of the time I use it because I have it and not because I want to use it. So Treasure Knight gets a D tier, is what I would say if this was me from two months ago, F tier. Before I move on, I just want to say I thought of a gimmick that's a billion times better than what we got for Treasure Knight that's also in line with his character. Every 15,000 gems, it'll increase your attack by one. So 30,000 is 3 attack, 45,000 is 4, you get the gist. This would have been balanced because you can't buy any relics, and if you do, your attack would go down. That would make him way better! Tinker Knight, on the other hand. Tinker Knight only has 3 HP and 1 attack, so that's pretty flabby from the get-go. But if you break blocks, he can harvest metal. Hitting the special button, if you have metal on you, you'll transform him into a robot mode. He'll now have 3 attack and 5 HP, but only for a limited amount of time. The amount of hits you can do in this form is dependent on how much metal you had going into it. All in all, a really good ability. A very fun character. And his Quandary is the mech, but bad. The mobile gear will function like the robot suit, except it goes in one straight line, and dependent on how much metal you had when when you sent it out, that will determine how much health it'll have. I mean, when he has the specific ability, Tinker Knight himself was up to 5 health, so I guess I could see that as being able to push it over the edge, but it's just not as good as the robot, unfortunately. All around, A tier character. Now, all of those guys are pretty good, but none of them can even pale in comparison to our shining achievement of a character. Definitively the best character in the entire game. Mole Knight for some reason. Yes, this kind of forgettable boss from the first game is now our best character. His ability lets you move underground, underneath enemies, and other things like that. Basically, he can go anywhere. Switch places with enemies so they can get into a better position. Grab a health potions on the other side of the map when you're cornered. It is so hard to actually die as Mole Knight unless you make a stupid misinput. Definitively the best character in the game in my opinion. Only rivaled slightly by one we'll talk about later. Now, his Quandary is a little worse. Underclaw lets him move freely throughout the entire map, but hitting X attacks. Now, you think this would be better, but for starters, you can't move enemies. And if a certain enemy has a puddle or something they leave on the ground, like all of the slimes, you can't avoid it. You're forced to take that damage from it. But just don't use that ability and you'll be fine, S tier. This is the power of never getting your bread. Stepping down from that one-man army of Mole Knight, we have Propeller Knight. Propeller Knight will increase an attack every solo enemy he kills. This can stack endlessly, by the way, to the point where he can do over 20 attack per damage. What? You will literally never need an attack that goes up that high, but cool. This will all go away, however, when he attacks a chain. It's a pretty okay gimmick, I guess. Not great, not terrible, pretty funny. And his Quandary, the corkscrew kick. This can both function as a get-out-of-jail-free card and a pretty good attack. You can charge it up by attacking in every direction, but once you do, you get a powered-up version of it that does extra damage and has the spear effect that pierces enemies. Not too terrible of a gimmick, but certainly not the best. I think he's earned, like, a C tier. Polar Knight honestly kind of disappointed me with his basic gimmick. He does more 
more damage against frozen foes and brutal damage against chains freezes enemies. Wow, wow, how wonderful. Yeah, it's pretty bad. You could have given him his shovel plow or maybe his literally anything else. It just kind of feels wasted. Now his quandary ability on the other hand is really something. He throws dogs at people. If you collect potions at max health, you can start charging up your spin wolf toss. And that toss can damage enemies, collect items, set off bombs, gain health for other spin wolves. Truly a package deal. This is one of my favorite characters to play as just because how f***ing stupid that gimmick is. I would go with A tier, but his base form really weighs him down a bunch, so B tier. And finally, for all of the basic characters, we have Prism Knight. She can teleport. So like a poor man's version of the Mole Knight's ability. I mean, I guess she can swap the position of enemies too, but that's not really something carrying this. Neither is her Quandary ability all too useful. She can create clones, which don't do much unless you're physically pushing them. Neither of these are great, if I'm being honest. I'm thinking like a D tier for her. But that's all of the characters you can get normally. There are some characters you have to go through other means to get. For starters, you can unlock Puzzle Knight as a playable character just by beating the campaign. His main ability is shuffling around enemies in a clockwise circle. So he's one of the best characters for lining up enemies without a doubt. And his Quandary is the spiritual shift. It can move enemies in a straight line like Paper Mario, the Organami King. The only problem is, is that these abilities are only very useful for lining up enemies here and there. It doesn't greatly impact the overall flow of everything, unlike the other overwhelmingly great abilities like Mole Knight's Dig and Polar Knight's Wolves. But what he has is still pretty nifty, so I would put him in B tier. Shield Knight was unlocked earlier from that one room, so let's talk about her. And Black Knight, since he's also unlocked that way. Starting off with Shield Knight, who has a pretty whatever gimmick. The bigger the chain you knock down, the more hits she can take of the next enemy before taking damage. Going up to three. Isn't really worth the trade-off of only having four health though, but her quandary gimmick on the other hand is phenomenal. She can throw her shield, which is a projectile, so you don't take any damage. It only takes away one health, but still. Now that's great by itself, but if you catch it, you can do one hit that does double damage. It also shields you for a small amount of time. Keyword if. If it drops over an enemy or somewhere you can't get it, you have to wait for it to fall down, then pick it up. That doesn't happen a lot, but definitely annoys you when it does. A tier. And now we have my favorite character, Black Knight. So Black Knight can convert his gems into an attack buff that only goes away when you heal. And you can keep stacking this too as long as you want. As long as you keep getting that gem meter back up, you can keep getting more attack. And with an attack of 8, it would not be hard in the slightest to get that thing to go up. You can stack this indefinitely too. The only time limit is accidentally boxing yourself in with a bunch of potions. And his quandary ability, I don't like nearly as much. You can drop a bunch of meteors in exchange for your gem meter, but they can also damage you. And you have a very small amount of time to actually get out of the way. I mean, at least he's back up to 5 health instead of his regular appearance where he only gets 3, but I really don't think that's enough of a trade-off. Black Knight is easily an S tier. I don't have a doubt about that. Now for a truly hidden character. So if you get a 100 in Mona's minigame, there's a random chance she can appear in a hidden room during her runs. And if you survive her genuinely hard bomb challenge, she'll be a character you can play as. Her main ability is blowing up potions. Somebody had to. She can only blow them up if she's along the same lines as them, so it becomes a strategy of maneuvering a bunch of potions, then blowing them all up. The explosions can only deal two damage, but you can activate them remotely, so who cares? The one drawback is that they can also deal damage to you, so be wary of that. And her quandary puts her so close to being an S tier. She can now take potions and charge up to 10 to throw bombs. Or you can use this point meter to heal at any time. So if you get stuck in a corner, you can either just keep healing and attacking until the thing blocking you is gone, or just bomb the shit out of it. I am so tempted to put her at the top, but unfortunately, I can kill God and I can dig under God are already up there, so I'm going to put her into the top of A tier. Alright, the next one's a pretty weird one. So Percy is in the game, and he can launch you to any level you want to for a certain price. You don't have any relics or anything, so it's not a great option, but it's there if you want it. But here's the thing, if you select Polar Knight and throw a Spin Wolf into his cannon, you can play as the dog. And he's top tier? Yeah, look at any high-ranking speedrun of this game, they all use Spin Wolf. The reason is he only has 4 health, but 2 attack. Which is obviously busted, but to counteract this, he is forced to move 2 tiles at a time. Which is very annoying, let me assure you. I was originally going to put him into F tier for this, until I was lambasted by the Shovel Knight Discord for saying that, so I'm putting him into the please don't hurt me because I don't think it's that good tier. And finally, the Quandary Sage, who was unlocked by spending hours of your life in the Endless Mode. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a line here. The Quandary Sage is bullshit, alright? You have to survive a hundred rounds of endless mode, which means clearing the campaign like five times in a row. So, I'm not doing that. Let's read the wiki together for what he can do instead. He has a spear permanently, but he can't get relics. Cool, that's great, moving on. And that's pretty much every character. But notice how I only put one character in F tier, though. 
That's because I'm really bad at planning ahead. King Knight moved down. But the thing is, they're not even bad characters. Hell, I would argue Treasure Knight is really fun, which is one of my favorite aspects of the game. The balance is incredible. I would argue none of the characters are bad. I mean, there are obviously better ones than others, like Black Knight and Mole Knight, but I don't think any of them suck. The worst it gets is a gimmick that wasn't fully realized. So yeah, pretty much every character is fun at least. Sorry that took a while, but I really wanted to go over all of them to just, just show how much effort was put into this game. And there is still more to talk about at Castle Quandary. The Legendary Path is one of those two portals we didn't talk about earlier. It's a completely changed version of the campaign with new enemies, mini bosses, the works. It's a lot of fun if you're getting bored of the regular route. And this other portal here is just for people who mod roguelites and like to see how far they can push the game until it breaks. Before every level, you have to accept one defect to then see how far you can get with that. It's as fun as it sounds. And aside from buying an endless amount of overpriced hats and palette swaps, there's not too much else we can do here in the hub. So let's head back to the Tower of Fate as Black Knight on Twitter.com and wrap this up. Up. I really hope I can make that joke make sense by the time this video is published. So we pop back to the Enchantress and yada yada yada, betrayal or something like that. Luckily, 8 plus attack, Black Knight beat the shit out of her in record time. He clearly doesn't have any resolve for absolutely demolishing women as long as it's not Shield Knight. And the Enchantress gets upset that we won at her game that was skewed in her favor. So she turns Puzzle Knight into this big old thing known as the Mastermind. Which is basically just all of her attacks but ramped up. The balls now go in four directions, the fire is now more all over the place, and those beams are larger. I have literally nothing else to say besides it's the Enchantress, but harder. At least its design looks cool. But after the Mastermind's defeat and Black Knight destroying the entire pocket dimension, because of course it can do that, everybody is free. Yeah, okay, the plot didn't really matter that much. The Enchantress is here without any explanation, and all of this is really just to put the plot in motion and explain why we're in a cube. But I do like the end scene of Prism Knight and Puzzle Knight. Turns out, Puzzle Knight is Prism Knight's father, who she was looking for this whole time. Maybe if every character didn't wear masks, she would have known this sooner. We learn the reason Puzzle Knight was even in the cube in the first place was because of its prize. Inside of it is a telescope that whenever you look up, a shooting star flies across the sky. It's so they could always find each other if they were separated. Really could have used that earlier, huh? And that's Shovel Knight Pocket Dungeon. I didn't talk about everything, like there's a marathon mode you'll knock after beating the base game, but it's literally just an endless mode, so who cares? Overall, I really enjoyed it. No, I didn't just really enjoy it, that was a blast! Which is surprising, because the game I immediately thought of when I saw this was Exit the Gungeon, a sequel to a highly successful indie game with the main target being mobile. In Exit the Gungeon's case, it was the same genre as the first one, leaving me questioning why I would ever play it over the original, especially considering it had less content, but Pocket Dungeon is completely different story. It's a great companion piece to Shovel Knight, a smaller experience that really isn't for the same demographic, but if you're a fan of Shovel Knight, you'll definitely enjoy this. Don't let it looking like a shitty mobile game deter you, this is a great roguelite. Not my favorite one, but I'm a fan. Hey, who knows, maybe one day I'll go for all achievements. The graphics looked charming, the playable character list is astounding, and the soundtrack is shockingly great. I didn't bring it up until now, but holy shit, man. All of the remixes of the original themes, also the new songs mixed in with them, it's just so... Supply. Good! If anything, check out this game's soundtrack. But with all of that praise, I do have complaints. Not every character felt entirely fleshed out. It was weird how some characters got abilities and some got near useless passive ones, like Polar Knight. I don't think it's nearly as replayable as other roguelites are, especially ones that are around the same price of $20. And while I'm talking about the price tag, that's pretty steep for everything you have on offer here. I mean, I think that's a pretty fair price, especially considering it's getting more DLC in the future. But for how simple the gameplay is, I think that price is a bit of a turn off. I mean, it was for me, I wasn't even gonna play it, but here we are. I would say it's worth $20, but doesn't have great curb appeal. Overall, I think Shovel Knight Pocket Dungeon is a good 7 out of 9. Yeah, I was gonna say something out of 10, but I don't know, I kinda like the Shovel Coin thing. A game that is definitely better if you are a fan of Shovel Knight. But if you're specifically in the market for roguelites in the Shovel Knight franchise, might I suggest our next game, Shovel Knight Dig. Okay, I genuinely don't understand Yacht Club. They made an entirely full-fledged prequel to the main game, and under a year after Pocket Dungeon came out. Pocket Dungeon even received support while it was in its first year and is getting more. How the hell did they manage- uh... Shovel Knight Dig released in September of 2022. If they finish Shovel Knight Dig this fast, I feel bad for yacht clubs development team. So this game starts and hold on, there's a game we missed. Yes, I actually neglected to talk about a game that came out before Dig or Pocket Dungeon, but it's not a video game. Shovel Knight Dungeon Duels is a board game based off the franchise. And I did say I wanted to talk about every game, this technically counts, so consider this my first board game review for the channel. Very big milestone, I know. So let's Shovel Knight Dungeon Duel. 
Okay, but why was that actually fun? Hey, the next five or six minutes are literally just going to be me. me just, they're just going to be me describing how to play a board game. If you're not that interested in that, you can just like go, go skip forward a few minutes. Yeah, I actually had a good time with this. It's like D&D, but with a twist. It's stupidly complex. So you start out with choosing a character, which can be any knight you want. Shovel Knight, Plague Knight, King Knight, Spectre Knight, Propeller Knight, any of them. Each knight comes with their own card displaying what they can do. They all have their own attack, defense, health, and jump stats. They also all have abilities that cost coins to use, like King Knight can do the dash, knocking over whoever he bumps into. Once everybody has selected their knight, whoever has most recently played Shovel Knight or used a shovel gets to go first. Yes, I'm not making that up. Each player starts with three coins, and all of the way at the back of the board here, the start tile. These mound pieces here are put in a staggered pattern, which I assure you we forgot to keep up with. Landing on one of them just gets you a random thing that could be more gems or coins or something like that. And enemies are placed on every tile there's a skull. Enemies are randomly selected from this stack of cards that are located over here. And before everything can begin, the first player has to select which boss you'll fight, which will determine which tiles you'll go over later. More on that when it's relevant though. Every player gets three movements they can perform every turn, and what you do with your moves is completely up to you. No dice rolling is involved for that. What dice rolling is involved for is literally everything else. If you want to jump over a spike pit, you have to roll the amount of jump symbols for how far you want to go. So if you want to move in an L shape, just roll two jumps and you're good. But you can only roll the amount of die equivalent to what your stat is. So if you have a jump stat of two, you can roll two die. Failing to jump over a spike pit just knocks you down and sends you back to the start. And getting knocked over takes one turn to recover from. And you can also use your moves to attack enemies. Like jumping, you can roll dice equal to the amount of attack you have. So you have three attack, you roll three dice. Defeating enemies gives you coins you can either use at Chester's shop or using your ability. Spending one coin will get you a relic or equipment randomly chosen from the deck over here. Relics are a one-time use and do what they are described on the card, and equipment are permanent, but you can only hold three. They can do things along the lines of increasing attack, defense, giving you more movements per turn, etc, etc. Once everybody's turn has passed, it's now the enemy's phase. They'll move one space towards the closest knight, and whoever is in their line of fire gets attacked. Same thing as when you're attacking the enemies except for the opposite. How much defense you have will block certain amounts of hits. So if you have two defense and you get hit four times, you only take two damage. And finally, after everybody has had a chance to move, including the enemies, the entire board will scroll, pushing over everybody to the far left, generating new mounds and enemies for that new tile. And that's the basic flow of the entire board game. Pretty complex and it took us a little bit to understand and I'm pretty sure we got a lot wrong, but it was actually really fun. Yeah, they somehow managed to turn Shovel Knight, the 2D side-scrolling video game, into a pretty fun board game. But what about that knight you chose at the start for your boss. Well, there are tiles corresponding with what stage you fought them in in regular Shovel Knight. We chose Tinker Knight, which means we get to go to the Clockwork Tower. And when you're fresh out of tiles for the Plains of Passage and the selected stage, you move on to the boss part. Each boss has an AI deck you need to shuffle, which just determines how they'll move. They call it an AI deck when it's really just random. Whoever defeats the boss gets five coins, and the player with the most coins at the end of the game wins it all. At max, it'll only take around an hour, but it was really enjoyable for the whole thing. I mean, excluding the learning process, but that's just kind of a thing that happens with all board games, especially since this is kind of diet D&D. I mean, it's literally in the title, Dungeon Duels. This is Shovel Knight D&D, &D, which is a bizarre concept, but it works really well. I don't have too much to say about Dungeon Duels besides it is in fact a board game, but if you're a diehard Shovel Knight fan and just so happen to know three other huge diehard Shovel Knight fans, I would recommend it. But it just kind of has the same problem with Shovel Knight Showdown. Like, finding three other Shovel Knight fans for Showdown was already a big ask, but now you ask for four in the same spot for a board game that costs more than all three Shovel Knight video games put together. I mean, if you have all of those conditions, this game could be a blast, but I don't see any of that happening. I really enjoyed it, but it just needs the right setup in order to be fully enjoyed. Wow, that certainly was a Shovel Knight board game, and I'm definitely not scripting this part ahead of me actually playing it. Let's go back to the video games now. So Shovel Knight is just chilling, minding his own business, so randomly the Tower of Fate's roof explodes and this troll guy comes out of nowhere. He takes all of his loot and leaves, and now it's your responsibility to get it back. I love this plot setup. I mean, if you think about it, all of the games starring Shovel Knight as the main character, they kind of go alongside the Mario Cast's main games, huh? The first one, you have to rescue a damsel in distress. There's obviously a lot more layers to it, but boiling it down, that's what it is. The second game, you have to save all of your friends from being trapped a la Luigi's Mansion. And the third one is like Wario Land, where you have to get that bag. That's literally the entire plot. Get your money, it's great. So let's Shovel Knight dig. Okay, I'm just gonna say this right out of the gate. The best way I can describe this game is a mix between Cult of the Lamb and Downwell. Cult of the Lamb in the way that you get to choose which path you go down at the end of every level, giving you a different reward or gimmick based on what you chose. And down well in the way that we are in fact going down a well. And you might be asking yourself, wait, aren't both of those games roguelites? Yes, and that's because Yacht Club has an obsession. There are now more Shovel Knight roguelites than there are main games. But it works a lot differently than Pocket Dungeon. For starters, it's back to being a platformer. And it's pretty close to how Shovel Knight functioned in the first outing.
going. Shovel swipes, Poe going, but now he can dig straight down and forward. Pretty much automatically always having the dust knuckles. And to simplify things, the pogo is automatic, so jumping on enemies is easier, but jumping onto blocks over spikes is pretty hard. Like combining the shovel pogo with Spectre Knight's jump, how it's uncontrollable. It's definitely here just to simplify it because of how the game plays, but I don't really mind it at all. More often than not, it's used so they can do some cool level designs. And that's literally all you can do. It's simple, but it works. The challenge isn't working with the movement, it's maneuvering the obstacle courses of levels they made. So every time you drop down, it's randomized, but it's pulled from a pool of a bunch of random stuff. All of that stuff being pre-made, and then the game stitches it all together. I am trying so hard not to compare this game to Enter the Gungeon right now. And specifically in our first world, The Mushroom Mines, it's done really well. If you watched that downwell video I made a little bit ago, which statistically you didn't, it's shockingly similar to that. There are rooms you can go to on the sides of the screen that do a bunch of different junk. Most times being a shop of two kinds, either Chester or new character Hans Molman. Chester does as he's always done, sells relics for your hard-earned gems. And Diggers B over here is a chef. They'll sell a bunch of different food-related items that can increase your max health, give you more magic, or just heal you. Also, real quick, magic lets you do more stuff with relics. So this is almost entirely like Downwell. Both games have your main character going down a vertical shaft with rooms off to the side collecting gems to spend at shops where they can either increase the capacity of the projectiles or give them more health. And each world is separated into three segments. Now children, all gather around. For the next probably like t half hour or so, you're going to see my slow descent into starting to hate this game. But as we go on, I would like you to see my pure emotions at what I was feeling at the time, blissfully unaware of how the game would turn out in the end. Are you ready, kids? Let's go! So if you liked down well, you'll probably like this. I love down well, man, hell yeah! It's crazy to me, it's crazy to me how there is no bad, only one bad shovel-like game. Yeah, the game is good, I like it. I have noticed I'm really positive about a lot of the games I've talked about around here, but that's not really a fault of me being too nice to them. I think that's just a fault of the games I choose. My last three videos, a roguelite I really liked, a roguelite I really liked, and now I'm doing two roguelites I really like. Now, going down the money pit, there are other things you can find alongside those shops I mentioned. You can find relics just sitting around the place, and gears. Gears, if you get all three of them, will open up the drill at the end of the level with goodies inside. You can choose between a random upgrade or a full heal. I won't be going over all of them, but such upgrades are limited to a more powerful slash if you do two consecutive pogos, a spark along the ground like the first game if you're at max health, bouncing on top of two enemies to receive a speed boost, a permanent discount at shops, and a variety of other things I forgot about. So we've talked about the end of the level and the secrets in the level, but how about the actual level? Well, they're all pretty fun. They are mostly comprised of small platforming challenges here and there, where you'll fight a bunch of enemies and dig a whole bunch, but they're all fun. I especially like how it didn't rely too much on previous enemies. I mean, obviously their mainstays are back with Beatos, Blorbs, Propeller Rats, Bone Clangs, the classics. But now we have new enemies, like these guys who have one eye and are annoying as f And the Mushroom Mines specifically have a way of mixing up that platforming. Enemies with shrooms on their head, as well as mushrooms that litter the ground are prevalent, as well as these little floaters that can turn you into small Shovel Knight like Kirby in the Amazing Mirror. They aren't too overbearing, but they're fun. All capped off with the boss of the world, being Spore Knight. Apparently they're working for Drill Knight, who was that guy who stole our bag from earlier. And they have this gem thing we want because it's shiny. So time to ruthlessly murder them. It's just an okay boss, really. They jump around, shoot the mushroom on their head, and do this one attack that confuses me a lot where it makes the ground bouncy and, like, puts mushrooms everywhere. But, like, they can't hurt you, and that attack is only really effective sometimes because only a little bit of the time are there spikes on the roof you can actually bounce into. Most of the time, this does nothing. But this is the first world boss, so of course it's not that hard. After their defeat, we finally get a glimpse at our bag as we frantically run towards it. I don't know what the hell this is, but that bag starts manifesting tentacles and boots us out of there pretty quickly. We don't get our bag, and we move on. So this is the point in the game where it splits. You have a choice between going to the fire area or the water area. And sometimes the game actually might let you get a choice because most of the times it just decides for you. The game decided it didn't want to give me the smell works, instead it gave me Hydrocity Zone. So let's talk about Atlantis Square Panis first. There's only so many joke names I can come up with before I have to Google the real one. Secret Fountain is our water level for the game that doesn't feature going underwater. I mean, I don't know how you would pull that off in a game like this, so it makes sense. Instead, we have aquatic themed enemies like fish that swim up water streams, crabs with giant claws, and new sponge slimes that if they touch water will fill up and gain more health. It's some great variety. If there's one thing you 
Cloud Cove can do, it's a great pool of enemies. On top of that, the Secret Fountain also has my favorite puzzles and stage design. Like, I don't know if I'll be able to find it in my footage, I'll just put it on screen if I didn't. But there's this one puzzle to get a gear that requires a crab to break a dirt block. Like, that sounds basic, but I didn't know crabs could do that up until that point, so it felt like a really cool discovery. But this world kind of brings up a problem with this game. Not the game itself, just specifically for me. Like, how much is there really to talk about? I mean, that's pretty much all of the gimmicks for the world going over in like, what, 30 seconds? I mean, the game is really fun, but there isn't too much I can really say. So sorry if I'm being brief for a lot of this going forward. Let's try to extend this segment as much as we can by talking about all of the other wacky rooms you can find off to the sides. I said it was mostly just the shops, but there are other things you can find here too. For starters, there's a guy who can upgrade your shovel for the rest of the run, who kind of reminds you of that one guy from Twilight Princess who was an older version of Link. I don't feel like recording footage for it, so if you know, you know. A lot of these are actually really good, like one that gives you an upgraded shovel drop where you can go straight through dirt and deal extra damage to bosses. One that gives you a levitating effect to your shovel swipe in the air, along with a bunch of others. You can sometimes find people here who just give you money for no reason, but great. This is one mole that can give you a random upgrade. Yeah, okay, I really thought I could get more out of that. I'm gonna be real. So we might as well go to the boss of the level, who is Mole Knight, surprisingly, donning an old new look as this fish thing. Hey, look, they even gave him thumbs. If you got that reference, I want to kiss you on the mouth. And this is a really cool fight. I love how they mix up what he did back in Treasure Trove, how he could go into walls and ceilings, but this time he can dive through the water and goes through pipes. He jumps around covered in water, getting bubbles everywhere. He'll dive out with a bunch of fish. It's a really fun fight. And canonically, the first time him and Shovel Knight meet, he doesn't recognize him next time. That's what going halfway across the color spectrum does to you, I guess. He gets flushed away 2006, and now we can move on to the next stupid bag mini game. We predictably don't get it, but this time we get knocked out and Shield Knight comes to see what's up. Yeah, she's just here for the entire game, which should be expected because this takes place before Treasure Trove, but I guess I'm just not used to seeing her too much. Should have probably put her in the thumbnail, shouldn't I? Shovel Knight says some ramblings about the burrow, and Shield Knight tells him to shut up before we get to move on to the next choice of area. Before we go down, let's pop back up without a good transition and head to what the other path could have taken us to. These smell works. This should be our generic lava level, but come on, have you learned nothing in the last three hours? Instead, taking more of a forage approach, and has some pretty cool gimmicks to boot. There's a special type of ground that can cause chain reactions if hit with fire, so of course there's a bunch of enemies that throw fireballs at you. There are turning, wisdoms, and flame slimes along with new enemies, like these flying dudes that shoot fireballs. And these thingies that shoot flames, if that counts. Definitely a lot harder than the secret fountain. Not a lot else to talk about except how we ouch fire, but something neat specific to here is a hidden room where you can find the blacksmith. He'll give you new armors and stuff, but we'll talk about him later. Something about the smelt works I really liked was all of the different varieties and paths you could take. Like one that kind of reminded me of the Abyss from Downwell. You're constantly hopping on stuff with nowhere to land, it's cool. Hell, I would argue this is just a direct homage to Downwell itself, especially considering how that was one of the main dev team's greatest inspirations. I told you everybody knew Downwell, but much like the area previously, I really don't have too much to say besides it's fun. So I might as well talk about the boss for the level, who is surprisingly and unsurprisingly Tinker Knight. It was kind of a dead giveaway with a bunch of his flying knives in the area previously. I love his first phase, it's so goofy. Him just being in this stinky ass little plane, it's adorable. But in Tinker Knight fashion, he has another phase where he actually starts. Instead of his mech from the last game, it's a giant magma submarine drill thingamabob. I love how they gave him a Monty Mole gimmick where he'll pop up through random holes in the drill. And progressively through the fight, more indicators will start popping up. It's just the developers trying to trick you into running to the fire, what assholes. That's pushed even farther when the drill slams into a wall, causing waves of lava to come hurtling at you. It's a really fun it's a really uh God, it's fun too much. It's a fight, okay? It's an entertaining fight, to say the least. And the same thing as Mole Knight's finale happens. You chase the bag, you don't get it, who cares? Something I really like about the game, though, is that those are the only two returning Order of No Quarter characters you'll fight in the whole game. Every other character from here on out is entirely original. Okay, mostly original. You'll understand when I show you what our next choice of paths are, being a choice between the Grub Pit or the Magic Landfill, returning from Pocket Dungeon. Let's start with Grub Pit because it's the new one. And to start it off, man, this music is insane. Guess I'll talk about the soundtrack while I'm here, and I'm happy to report, like the last two games, that's incredible. Something I like about all of the Shovel Knight games is that they all have their own musical identity. Shovel Knight's was obviously NES inspired, Diggs is very Genesis feeling, and Pocket Dungeon is off doing its own thing, picking grass in the soccer field. All of the OSTs are great. I would highly suggest you check out all of them. I was considering ranking them, but I can't even do that. They're all so equally amazing. Jake Kaufman, I could kiss you. So anyway, the Grub Pit. It's probably my second favorite area of the whole game. Yes, something funny about Shovel 
Eggplant Dig is that it actually gets better as you progress. I'm gonna be eating those words later. With the mushroom, whatever it was called, being my least favorite section in all honesty. Nothing wrong with it, it's just bland. Like, yeah, that's intentional, but still. They treat it on the same level with all of this cool stuff we get to go through. It'd be like if they did that with the Planes of Passage from the first game. The Grub Pit just kind of throws a bunch of shit at the wall, and intentionally or not, it all sticks. I would find it hard for anything not to stick down there. <laughs> Prominent gimmicks. I've been using the word gimmick way too much in this video. Synonyms for gimmick. Okay, sure. Prominent publicity devices used here are these guys who hide in walls and shoot rocks. You have to deflect the rocks back at them, which can be very annoying if you're trying to do other things within the level. I have no feelings one way or the other about these guys next. These new red blocks that cause teeth to come out of them, or whatever the hell those are supposed to be, right after you dig into them. And randomly on the third level, this lumpy tush animation looking ass invincible green wide stupid bug comes out of nowhere. It's annoying, but in a good way. All of this junk comes together to make this my favorite level out of all of them. And on the topic of insects, let's talk about a side room. I forgot about until just now. You can randomly find eggs scattered throughout the areas, and if you put one of them into these beds, depending on what bed it is, you'll get a little dude who can help you. Kinda like the decrees from King of Cards. The fairy attacks people occasionally, the griffoth shoots fireballs, the slime headbutts into pedestrians, and the truffle fish just heals you. These are really cool for some reason I can't think of. I think this video has given me writer's block halfway through scripting it, so let's go fight a bug. Hive Knight is honestly just okay as a boss. It was way funnier the first time I did this because when I fought him, Shield Knight gave me the skeleton key which led to a screwdriver that could one-shot anything, so I entered the arena and immediately annihilated him. It was hilarious. I love video games. They'll let me live out my fantasies of eradicating insects. But the actual fight. It's a tag team battle, which I'm surprised it took Yakub this long to think of something like that. And I'm kind of glad it took them a while, because I don't think they did it too greatly here. If you hit his bug, he'll get real mad and start coming towards you to attack. They also do combo attacks, or he'll catch you in his net, and his stupid idiot dumb bug insect will start dive-bombing you. Like, cool, I guess. Probably the second worst boss in the game. Sport Knight takes the crown for my least favorite. They just never stopped teleporting! Well, that certainly was a grub pit. Now for the B path, the magic landfill. Oh gee, are you prepared for me to list the gimmicks of the stage? Quite possibly the enemies? Something else I need to talk about? Then the boss? Have you gotten tired of me yet? Statistically, 95% of viewers have! Since this place is to the brim with magic, a lot of times you'll have this little effect on your screen which indicates you can use relics as much as you want. Unlimited magic, basically. And I'm not sure if I said it earlier or not because this video has taken me a whole month to write, but I'm not going over every relic because you can only only have one at a time, and a lot of them are just not interesting. Like the Warhorn and the Flare Wand are pretty much exactly what they were in the base game. Just bouncing and with a larger radius this time. The Propeller Dagger is here, which will instead let you fly upwards, which can be pretty nifty. But those are really the only ones that stand out in my mind, the rest just kind of blend together. Like the Wind Variant of the Flare Wand, which just makes it travel along surfaces. Yippee. And then there's more useless ones, like the stupid axe. It does a lot of damage, but it travels at the most ungodly arc imaginable. A lot of relics are just either not good or they're fine. On top of infinite magic, there are also books that if you land on them will snap closed after a few seconds. Cool, I guess. We also have this ground you can ping pong through, and portals that loop you to the other side of the screen, like in King of Cards. The magic landfill introduces a bunch of new gimmicks, but none of them really stick out in my mind too much. Hell, I had to look back at my footage just to remember those latter two. Just an alright area all around. Looks pretty as hell though. Yeah, that's one thing I really do like about this game. It looks great. Probably the best looking Shovel Knight game yet. All its funky looking backgrounds and color schemes are just gorgeous. Now, unlike the Grub Pit where I love the level but the boss is okay, it's the exact inverse of the Magic Landfill, where we get the returning Scrap Knight in the returning same exact cutscene. Scrap Knight is mad that she found the map to something but doesn't get to go there for finding whatever the hell they're looking for. But anyway, her boss. It's really cool. It's probably the most unique boss out of all of these. She'll throw a bunch of junk at you, roll around on her ball, which I swear is unavoidable. And also, I have to watch my wording here. Suck you up into her bag. Nope, that's bad. Her sack. Nope, that's even worse. She'll do the thing that's happening on screen right now, and then you'll have to fight her with her little bit of remaining HP inside the bag. She'll really only dive through these portals, but it's a really cool way of ending the fight. So no matter which route you choose back there, you can only have one option for the final, and that's to go through Drill Knight's castle. Each level introduces its own gimmick, so buckle up. The first one is pretty simple, only having these two drills that will connect and send a laser through like 40% of the screen. Pretty manageable. For no reason, let's flash over to what's happening on the surface as we're down here. Does anybody else remember that one Spongebob episode where Spongebob and Patrick dug underneath everybody's houses and locked them all underground?
Yeah, that happens. So now the second level, the entire Tower of Fate falls and is now part of his castle. That is hilarious aesthetically. Nothing too notable at level two, except the drill lasers getting faster. And level three, where we get these giant ass fuck you spikes. Yeah, these annoy me. They can destroy the cogs to say screw you if you wanted more health before the final boss. This entire world is hard as hell, but intentionally so. I would argue this entire game is really difficult, but I'll talk about that. Later. Anyway, we meet up with Shield Knight, who's barely managing to keep one of those swords off of her before bending it and moving on to the next one. She creates a little passage for us to move through, and we get separated, so it's time for a 1v1 with Drill Knight. We also get to take a peek at that treasure room he was in. I have literally no recollection of anything he said here, so it's time to beat the shit out of each other. It's a pretty good fight, I guess. He'll drill through the walls and ceilings, launch his arms at you, and dash straight forward, getting his hand stuck in a wall. But then phase two, he'll start making these rows of dirt that come at you, where you'll have to dig frantically while you try to avoid him turning into a Beyblade. My only problem with this fight is like, didn't Mole Knight do like 90% of this back in Treasure Trove? I guess you could say canonically it's kind of a cute thing since they're on the same team, maybe he got inspired by Drill Knight or something, but in gameplay it just kind of feels like been there, done that. Except for when he gets down to two health, where he summons this giant ass Saw Blade. The same one that chases you throughout the entire game if you spend too long. He just kind of camps to the right side of the screen waiting for you to die, I guess that was pretty cool. But now that Drill Knight has been bested, Shield Knight bursts into the room with one of Drill Knight's digging machines. We grab our bag and we get to go home. We're also treated to this fun cutscene of going back up through the entire well. And that's the game, at least the base game anyways. Yeah, it's a roguelite, of course there's a secret final boss, are you stupid? I'll talk about that in a minute though. We get a final cutscene of showing off what everybody is up to after this, like Tinker Knight starting production of his giant mech, and Chester and Scrap Knight screwing. Drill Knight gets sent into jail, but unfortunately they put the guy with giant drills for hands in a regular cell. All's well that ends well. All of a bunch of nonsense and we get one final shot of Shieldy and Shovely with their bag back. The reason he went through all this headache was because one of the things that was in there. It's an orb that'll virtually take them back to their original treasure hoard, or as he calls it, the burrow. And they have a final sweet moment as we cut to credits. Yeah, that was pretty anticlimactic, so time for the real ending. I'm just gonna quickly rapid fire off some of the stuff that's up here on the surface since we're back. Chester's shop sells permanent upgrades. There's a dude over here who will let you skip to any world you want to for a fee. The blacksmith sells armor, and Hoofman is a sham. One thing that really disappointed me about this game is the armors you can choose from. All of them, in my opinion, are equally useless. Honestly, I would argue the base armor set is the best one. Because of this, I won't be going over all of them, because just stick with the regular one. And if you want variety, go with one of the others, I guess. Otherwise, save your gems for better things. And while I'm complaining, let's talk about how you can actually get the true ending. And this is where the game stopped becoming good. So, I'm pretty used to roguelikes having really wacky conditions in order to get your final ending. Dead Cells, I've never played it, but I know the Binding of Isaac is actual insanity. And much as I've tried to avoid bringing it up during this video, Enter the Gungeon. Hell, Pocket Dungeon from this video had a pretty wacky one. You usually have to go really out of your way if you want the true ending. But I'm just gonna say, this is one of the worst I've had to go through. So allow me to give it to you all in one take. So you first need to get Atlas the Owl off to the right side of the screen into the well with you. You can achieve that by shovel dropping onto him where he'll join you in your next run. Then you need to find him because he's playing hide and seek in one of the hidden rooms to activate the next trigger. Shield Knight will be at the bottom of World 1 well with Atlas making your only path forward through one of the areas. Then in level 1 you'll find Chester with Atlas in the same room and you have to purchase the reusable cog he sells and if you don't you have to restart. So now that you have that you have to get all three cogs within a level where Atlas will jam the drill with the fourth one, making it unusable for the rest of the location. Then after delivering a beatdown of the boss, Shield Knight will drop through with the repair drill, making you go off to the blocked area, which is the secret fountain or the smelt works, depending on which one you were currently in. Then when you're in there, you have to give up three of your upgrades to these statues in order to get rewards. And at the end of the world, Shield Knight will give you the skeleton key that's usable in the grub pit. You then have to make your way to the skeleton door, and if you miss it, tough shit, restart the entire run. And inside that room is a screwdriver item that previously stomped the bug. Then then... <laughs> Atlas grabs the thing, we're given our final step before we can move on to our true ending. You have to deliver a bomb to the sidewall inside the magic land bill, doing so will blow up a way to Atlas to get easily through to Drill Knight's castle. Put yourself in my shoes for a second. You've done countless attempts to get this stupid ending, and you're finally, FINALLY at the last step. All you need to do is get the bomb down there, and you accidentally smack it. Now, if you smack the bomb, you'll have a few seconds to pick it back up like Baby Mario from Yoshi's Island. But I didn't know that. Nothing indicates that I was supposed to run towards the ticking bomb. And if you mess up now, the entire run is forfeit.
I give up. I'm sorry, I give up. I'm not doing it. I'm stealing footage of the true ending off the internet. If you have a problem with that, fuck off. This game has emotionally drained me. I am so... So tired. So Atlas gets sucked through a tube. Yeah, cool. Who cares? We can move on to Drill Knight's castle where he gives us the Omega Screwdriver. So now we can go into Drill Knight's boss and throw the Omega Screwdriver at the big saw. If you do not throw the screwdriver at the Omega saw, you do not get the secret ending because of course. A big hole gets made in the floor and Drill Knight hops right in where we get to move on to the Crystal Cave. I am tired of explaining things, so we're moving right on. We walk in on Drill Knight messing with this thingy until it goes kablooey and what do you know? The amulet containing the Enchantress. She goes completely haywire putting all of the other knights into gems and possessing Drill Knight himself. So we now have to fight this bigger version of him that moves downwards alongside the screen with periodically dropping further downwards while we have to avoid obstacles and this is literally just the final boss from Downwell. Like, I'm not sugarcoating it, this is literally the final boss from Downwell. And the day has been saved, hooray! The Enchantress gets crammed back in her gem and Drill Knight goes home empty handed. Also the Tower of Fate gets blown back up into the surface because of all of this. And you know what you get for all of this work? Let me just put this in perspective for a second, okay? In other roguelites, like, let's just use Enter the Gun for an example again. If for all of the work of like going through all those chambers and killing all of the paths, you get a new floor and a new final boss. That's really cool. Oh my god, if I've been muted. No, okay. Oh my god. You get a new floor and a new final boss, which is really cool. Or if you get all of the completion stuff in RoboQuest, the final boss area will be easier, which is really cool. Or just to use Pocket Dungeon again, you get two new final bosses, the Enchantress and the Mastermind. So now what about Shovel Knight Dig? Well, obviously a new boss, but what about our final reward? Like what you get for all of it? Can you even guess what you get for all of this? Maybe a new cutscene where some cool thing happens, or maybe an alternate version of the last cutscene with slightly changed dialogue and the exact same payoff, but this time they're talking about going to the Tower of Fate, which we know she gets immediately corrupted in, so is it really a happy ending? And guess what happens? This is the most bullshit roguelite I have ever played. Yeah, I've been pretty positive for the last, like, I don't know, like 20 -ish minutes or so. I'm going to tell you now why I actually don't really like this game very much. So I've gone on record so far saying this game is such things as fun or neat or cool way too many times. Various other words along those lines. But those are pretty much in the moment kind of things. How I tend to script my videos is while I'm going through the game, I like to script them. So I'll play a part, then I script it. Play another part, then I script it. Kind of like that. The more I've been playing it though, I can see the flaws. So allow me to talk about why I show Shovel Knight Dig is a mess. For starters, Shovel Knight himself and the world he interacts with. I'm going to be comparing everything to Downwell since that's its only real competition besides other roguelites, and it's its biggest inspiration. Also the only thing remotely close to it. So in Downwell, enemies would exclusively come from below you, and if they got above you, it was almost entirely your fault. Since the screen is so small, if one of them got past you, it's all on you for failing to kill them or just letting one fall past you. But in Shovel Knight Dig, since it's a widescreen game, enemies can get above you and will get above you all of the time. Now, this wouldn't be an issue if you could attack up. Shovel Knight from Shovel of Hope couldn't do that either, but there were relics that could counteract that and enemies typically came from in front of you, since it's a platformer. Well, in Shovel Knight Dig, it is a problem because there are very few relics that actually go above you. I guess the propeller dagger, but that's about it. The axe from earlier, but unless you space it properly, is horrible. And the war horn, but that's just kind of everywhere. All they needed to do was give him an attack where he swung the shovel above him. Because how is it if an enemy gets above you, it's not only completely out of your control, but stupidly hard to avoid getting hit because of it. It's incredibly punishing for something you couldn't even prevent. Hey, do y'all know the worst part of it? So I, when I was editing this, I was looking through a bunch of the footage, and I was coming to like the, you know, the part where you beat Drill Knight and stuff, uh, and I want to show you something real funny about that. So when Shovel Knight's putting his bag back in, in the drill thing, uh, look at this. I'm just gonna zoom in here. He has an attack where he swings upward. Just put it in the fucking game. It does the same thing a lot of roguelites do with procedural generation, where things will change every time you go down. Specifically, the enter the dungeon way of doing it, where it's a bunch of pre-made layouts all stitched together. But the problem is, they only made like 10 per world. So if you do a few runs of this, which if you want the true ending, you will be, I guarantee you, you're going to see rooms repeat incredibly often. On the topic of little variety, if you're doing a regular run, you only fight four bosses who are all the same and never change. It's hard for me to not compare this game to Enter the Gungeon or The Binding of Isaac. 
Magic. How into the Gungeon mixed up its bosses for most of the floor is that it would pull a random boss from a pool of three. It's especially hard to not compare this game to games like it when they're all around the same price. Hell, Shovel Knight Dig is more expensive than Gungeon. It's 25 whole dollars. For that same price, you could buy Cult of the Lamb, RoboQuest, Risk of Rain 2, Hades, Dead Cells, and probably a bunch of others you haven't heard of. Or more accurately, I haven't heard of. For even cheaper than that, you can get The Binding of Isaac, Enter the Gungeon, Have a Nice Death, Vampire Survivors, Noda, Brotato, and a dozen others on top of that. All of them in which I would recommend over this. Especially considering a lot of those are cheaper. I don't hate Shovel Knight Dig. I just really don't like it. The bosses are repetitive, the enemy spam is unfair, like seriously look at this. The layouts are reused way too often, and the true ending can suck my nuts. Look, I don't hate Yacht Club, in fact, I love Yacht Club. They have made phenomenal games. If I didn't like them, why would I have made this video? Now, I'm not even talking about just games in the Shovel Knight franchise, Men of the Hollow War looks great, but I think they just f***ing suck at making roguelites. Granted, Pocket Dungeon was really good, but it wasn't fully a roguelite. It was an option you could pick inside the game. Just because I can put socks in my sandwich doesn't make it edible. Overall, I just can't recommend Shovel Knight Dig, even though I really want to, okay? I love Shovel Knight, the characters, the franchise, look at me in this picture, I love it. And it just pains me to say that I don't like this game. I really want to as well. The music is really good, the visuals look incredible, but... I can say that about the other games too. I mean, your predecessors have already done your greatest strengths, what else do you have? Despite my love for this IP, Shovel Knight Dig is a game I cannot recommend. Well, that was anticlimactic. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for Gaspacho 1 and hastily adds a lore chapter to the end of the video because he forgot to do it until a month after he finished the script. So first off in the timeline, we have Shovel Knight Dig. Shovel Knight is just chilling until whammo, big drill dude comes from the sky and takes his shit. It's now up to him and Shield Knight to get all of their cool stuff back. After defeating a bunch of people we'll never see again, plus Mole Knight and Tinker Knight, he lays the smack down on that drill dozer. They also somehow manage to make the ginormous tower entirely fall underground. Sure, why not? After defeating Drill Knight, our duo chases them onto the top of the tower of fate which has fallen underground, and Drill Knight and company get f***ed up so we have to defeat them. The amulet gets put back as well as this wacky spirit, and the tower of fate gets put back to where it was before mom gets home to realize we broke it. But Shield Knight and Shovel Knight aren't just content to let some random ass power source they found stay up there, it's now their mission to thwart evil once again. And to stage right, we have Luan and Donovan, two adventurers also going to the top of the tower so they can protect Luan's son, Reese. Luan and Donovan meet Shield Knight at the top of the tower, and she tells them not to touch it, so they obviously ignore her and absolutely touch it. But Shield Knight stops them, and the tower collapses because of their battle. Shovel Knight, who is somewhere farther down the tower, gets knocked out right as he sees Shield Knight get all messed up and stuff. So he immediately retires, assuming she's dead, not even double checking or anything. While he's learning what a 401k is, good old Donovan is getting a second chance at life from the Enchantress, and is off on his quest to collect 10 pages from the Forbes before Slenderman gets him. While that's going on, the Enchantress sets up a game known as Jousis. This will hopefully learn and a knight who is not only strong, but cunning enough to defeat the Joustus judges. Unfortunately, she only got one of those because King Knight stepped up to the task and started making his way through, at parts crossing ways with Spectre Knight, who is in the process of gathering members. The order he recruits them doesn't really matter, but all that is important is that King Knight is last. King Knight is successfully brought to the Tower of Fate and joins the Order of Quarter. At roughly around the same time, Spectre Knight is finishing gathering everybody and also joins. By the way, all of that took place over the span of like a day or two. Now we cut back to Shovel Knight, who just finished paying off his mortgage in a single day. He learns that there's trouble brewing and he's ready to put a lid on it. As he goes through different locations on his quest, Plague Knight is not far behind him, beating the shit out of all of his friends for a different reason. He wants to create a potion that'll make his dick bigger or something like that to win over Mona, his fellow researcher scientist lady. So they both go through delivering a beatdown onto everybody and even crossing paths at different points. Until they both arrive at the Tower of Fate. Plague Knight beats up the Enchantress, getting her essence and completing the potion. Then Shovel Knight comes in and does the same, but this time shattering the amulet and getting his wife back. On the topic of trying to get hitched, Plague Knight, who is in the other room, just finished brewing his furious cocktail when Mona barges in, with good old Black Knight trying to stop him. But it's already too late. Both of our heroes duke it out with some giant-ass monster and save the day, mostly. Shield Knight sacrifices herself, saving Shovel Knight from the big wig, and Plague Knight blows up the tower because he's bored. Shovel Knight is dragged back to his camp with the aid of Black Knight, and Plague Knight finally gets laid. Happy endings all around. Also, I'm not even going to attempt fitting Shovel Knight Pocket Dungeon into this timeline, because it makes absolutely no sense. I'm 
not exactly sure how I'm supposed to smoothly transition back into ending, so I'm just going to... Well, that was anticlimactic. Yeah, that works. So that's it. That's every Shovel Knight game. Sorry we had to end on a somber note, but the last big video was too jolly. I had to bring the mood back down. Overall, as a franchise, Shovel Knight is awesome. An amazing first outing, a really fun spin-off roguelite, a board game for some reason, and a really painful spin-off roguelite. It's kind of crazy how long I've been a Shovel Knight fan, honestly. I still have faint memories of watching the trailer for it on my mom's crappy old laptop when I was like five or six. And you know what? I'm happy how far it's gotten, because Shovel Knight is debatably THE indie game. The one that transcends all others. The one that no matter how irrelevant it becomes, people will automatically think of when they hear indie game. That or Undertale. There's not too much I can really say at this point, except happy 10th birthday, little dude. Here's to another 10 years. Still f***ing Knight though.